All right, uh, thanks everybody for coming. So today we have Edward Kennedy, who is great and smart, and uh, we tried to hire him a couple years ago, and he told us to go to hell. So, uh, I feel guilty. And I that, so. Thanks. Yeah, uh, welcome everybody, thanks for coming. Yeah, definitely feel free to sign me at any point. Uh, we don't have to go through all the material, and we can spend more time on certain things if you guys are more interested in parts. Uh, so yeah, feel free to, to speak up. If you want me to go into more detail about anything, I feel like it'd be more fun if, if there's more discussion and stuff. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about <coughs> non-parametric efficiency theory and machine learning and causal inference. Uh, how many people have seen like causal inference papers and or taken a class or something? So most, okay. So you're familiar with sort of the basic ideas of causal inference and notation and stuff. Uh, all right. So some of the first part might be some review. Uh, but that's all right. So. Yeah, I'll start by giving kind of the way I, I think about causal inference uh, in general. And then I'll talk uh, probably for most of the time about the statistics side of causal inference. So um, once we have some kind of causal quantity that we're interested in, what's the best we can do in estimating that quantity and how can we actually construct estimators that, um, that are optimal in a, a certain sense. <clears throat> uh, in particular, how can we do this in non-parametric models where we're not making uh, too many assumptions, and where we can sort of try and incorporate some modern, you know, flexible regression tools and machine learning tools along the way. So that's sort of the big picture perspective. Here's a, a breakdown of all the things we could go through. I might skip some parts. Um, and also, these slides are on my website, uh, on my research page at the, the, the bottom, or version of the slide. So, um, yeah, feel free to access those whenever. Uh, so I have a few disclaimers. So one is uh, this theory was mostly developed by lots of people in the past 40, 50 years. Um, so uh, there's a long list of, of names of people who worked on these topics. Uh, this is mostly a review um, uh, yeah, of, of other people's work, some people at NC State. Um, so yeah, it, it's worth checking out these papers. And I have a, a reading list at the uh, end of the slides where uh, I listed some of my favorite papers that are nice and readable uh, that aren't too bad. So one of the problems, I think, in this literature is that uh, a lot of the results are sort of scattered across uh, across papers and they're really hard to read. And I spent lots of time trying to read them as a grad student, so I wanted to try and condense it and make it easier for people to, um, to understand the stuff. Um, and yeah, so semi-parametrics, non-parametric efficiency, these are huge fields, uh, functional estimation. So this is necessarily going to be driven by some, you know, my particular interests, mostly in causal inference. Um, but there's there are tons of topics outside of this too that you can you can explore. And I'm not claiming to cover all of uh, semi-parametrics or non-parametrics. Um, and then some of the stuff I'll be talking about is just sort of my own perspective, and you can disagree with with me. And, and uh, if you do, it would be fun to have a discussion about it. Um, so yeah, take everything I say with a grain of salt. Uh, okay, um, so let's just jump in. So the first uh, part I wanted to talk about is just uh, sort of how we set up these problems, or how I like to set up these problems. So I think it's it's really crucial to uh, clearly define your goal. So I, I think in a lot of work that I see, there's some sort of vague notion of what is supposed to be uh, accomplished, but it's not exactly clear what exactly is going on. So uh, I think this is especially important in causal inference. So, uh, especially in terms of uh, so in estimation problems, uh, functional estimation problems in particular, I think it's really crucial to start out with you know what's the quantity you're trying to trying to estimate. Um, it's, it's a very simple idea, but I think it's really important and often overlooked. Uh, so let's call this uh, psi or psi star. So this is just this is our goal. This is the thing that we uh, we're aiming at that we want to estimate with data. It's the main sort of feature of our analysis. Uh, so in causal problems, the, the sort of classic estimate, uh, you know, the most basic estimate is something like an average treatment effect, what would happen if everyone was treated versus if no one was treated. Um, so maybe we're comparing mean outcomes under these two hypothetical interventions. Um, I'll define these mathematically in just a, a bit. Um, and so, uh, I call this a functional, uh, if people call this a function, functional in general, um, because it's uh, it's a function of the probability of distribution, say, that we're sampling from. Um, 
and it, it's uh, some sort of map, so it eats up the probability distribution and spits out, say, a real number. So like the average treatment effect, there's some complex underlying uh, process that uh, explains you know, confounding and the way treatment's assigned and the way outcomes occur. Um, but what we care about estimating is this, uh, this one number, which is the average treatment effect. Um, and sort of a spoiler alert is that when you're interested in functional estimation, so when you're trying to not estimate an entire probability distribution, but just some functional of it, you can really do sort of magical things and do very well in non-parametric models, uh, exploiting the fact that you, uh, you're not trying to estimate the whole thing, but you can sort of especially tailor your analysis um, to, to doing well for a given functional. Um, I think this is a really cool part of functional estimation uh, that underlies pretty much the whole talk. Um, right, so how do we actually pick this target? Um, Right, so ideally it would be based purely on scientific concerns, but I think this isn't the way it happens in practice, right? So sometimes uh, people just define a target sort of in, in vague terms as, as the effect without saying exactly what effect they're thinking about and what population is this effect uh, 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 taking place in. Um, sometimes it's just sort of based on convenience. So you fit a bunch of models, say, and then you pick out a coefficient in the model. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think there are sort of, maybe in broad terms, two kind of uh, approaches I've, I've seen in practice. So one is to just model everything, uh, right? model the entire way that your uh, uh, data are generated, and then try and use this sort of big comprehensive model to answer all questions that you could possibly generate. Um, and then a second approach, which is one I'll try and sort of advocate here, is that you start and set of the question, and maybe model the whole probability distribution along the way, um, but you tailor your analysis in a specific way to answer your specific question well. Instead of fitting one big model and assuming everything is, is correct and true and then trying to answer everything with that, that one model. Um, hopefully that becomes more clear throughout. Um, so I like this because uh, you can actually prove that you can do much better uh, with, with the second approach if you tailor your analysis in a specific <coughs> way that I'll talk about uh, throughout. And I also like it just because it sort of forces you to think hard about the question in a way that I think maybe the first approach allows you to bypass somehow. Yeah, so I think picking the, the target is really uh, really important. Otherwise, I feel like there's no way to um, you know think about how well you're doing, how uh, no way to sort of quantify uh, the operating characteristics of your approach if it's not clear even what target you're you're aiming at, right? what effect you're going for. What parameter you're trying to estimate. All right, so in causal inference, a common way to sort of start with picking a, a target parameter uh, would be to ask, you know, what would you do in ideal circumstances if you could run some some experiment if all of life was sort of a simulation and you could uh, say give everyone treatment and roll back time and then withhold treatment from everyone? Right, we could never do this, but you can imagine uh, starting with some hypothetical intervention and using that to define your goal. So it's it's the ideal. Uh, parameter that you would estimate if you could, and then we can try and see if we can get near that with the observed data we, we collect, and sometimes we can. Um, right, so in a missing data problem, uh, this could be something like, what would have happened if I had forced everyone to give me their lab values? So in practice, you know, some people uh, didn't come back to the, the lab to, to meet with me um, to, to have these things measured, but what, what would have happened if I, you know, what would the mean outcome be, say, if I, uh, if I forced everyone to, to come in, that's sort of a missing data case, right? The, the uh, classic causal inference uh, parameter is what would happen if I gave everyone treatment and then went back in time and, and gave no one treatment. Uh, and we can never do these things, but we can think about uh, doing them. Uh, so those are two interventions that uh, are somehow easier to think about. Uh, one that's less easy to think about would be maybe force everyone to become obese somehow and, and see what happens after 30 years, right? This is a very difficult one, but we can still possibly uh, conceptualize it. Um, and so the uh, causal inference, right, I, I think a big part of, a big contribution of the causal inference literature and, and uh, people who work in this area is a way to uh, sort of uh, formally define uh, parameters that represent these kinds of hypothetical interventions. So I argue that a lot of people, uh, when they're doing science, are interested in these kinds of hypothetical interventions. And what would happen if we change the circumstances somehow? What would happen if we implemented this policy versus this one? Um, 
uh, and, and causal inference lets us uh, explicitly say what these quantities are in a, a formal mathematical way. So we can do this in a, a variety of, of uh, approaches. So we can use potential outcomes. Uh, that's what I'll be using uh, throughout the talk. But you could also use structural equations or graphs. Um, all right, so just some notation. Uh, I'll use potential outcomes uh, as superscripts. Everyone uses different uh, approaches here for some reason. But um, right, so for example, YA. Uh, would be the outcome we would have observed if you had sort of forced someone to receive treatment level little a. Does everyone see potential outcomes? Uh, so you can think about potential outcomes under complex sequences of, of treatments as well, not just a single um, time point treatment. You can think about uh, what outcome we would have uh, observed if we had forced some treatment sequence over time, say, some vector of treatments to be a given value. Uh, you can also think about more complex and uh, sometimes more practical interventions, like stochastic interventions, where instead of saying, what would happen if I gave this person uh, you know, treatment or, or control, maybe I'll flip a coin to decide their, their treatment. Um, and maybe I'll let that coin flip depend on their particular characteristics in some way. So there are lots of different interventions. You can think about lots of different, uh, I think this is one of the cool things about causal inference that you can, uh, I think every problem essentially has a different sort of uh, parameter that, uh, that's useful because everyone has different questions about their uh, specific, uh, <coughs> specific problems. <coughs> and so there are tons of interesting causal effects you can think about. They all require slightly different uh, approaches for estimation and things. Um, right, so the most basic causal effect parameter is just the mean outcome if everyone was treated versus no one was treated. Um, you could also think about this as sort of the mean individual treatment effect uh, for each person across the whole population. So if you think about y1 minus y0 being an individual's treatment effect, then it's the average across, across everyone of these individual effects. Um, a slightly more interesting parameter, maybe, or harder to estimate at least parameter, is the conditional effect. So this is uh, this tells us something about how treatment effects vary with, with covariate information. And this is super useful because it lets us, uh, for example, tailor policies or treatments uh, to individual people based on their how they look in practice. Right? So this is the sort of basis behind personalized medicine and things like this. Um, so a local average treatment effect, this comes up in uh, often in confounded studies where, where uh, there's some complex confounding of, of the treatment assignment that isn't captured in the data. Um, so this is a, a treatment effect in some subgroup. It's a, an effect of, of treatment among people who are affected by, uh, in this case, um, uh, receipt of, of an instrument. Uh, and so being encouraged to take treatment versus not. Uh, I'll talk more about this in a little bit. These are just a bunch of examples of the kinds of things that, that you should be thinking about uh, that we want to estimate in, in these problems. Uh, so the dose response curve, now this is a function uh, instead of just a number. We could think about if A is continuous, this tells us uh, right, what mean outcome would be if we signed everyone some particular dose. Uh, you could think about the optimal uh, treatment strategy. So now this is uh, maybe even more complex. So now we want to find, say, the, the map the rule for assigning treatment, which is a map from, say, covariates to the, the treatment space that maximizes the mean outcome if we implemented this in, in the entire uh, population. In time varying settings, you could think about uh, <coughs> right, sort of more complicated causal effects. I think once you introduce uh, sequential treatments, the number of kind, the, the kinds of uh, causal effects you can think about sort of explodes, and uh, this is a really interesting problem in general. So a classic parameter that people like to think about in, in longitudinal settings is uh, a marginal structural model parameter. And this says, uh, what would the mean outcome be if I assigned everyone some sequence of treatments? So maybe I'll force everyone to take treatment at every single time. I'll see what their mean outcome looks like uh, versus I'll uh, force everyone to take control at every single time and see what the outcome looks like, possibly conditional on some covariance. Uh, Another sort of classic way to think about effects in, in longitudinal studies, which is a structural nested model that's um, slightly different. It's a more conditional effect. So it says, given all the history up to a given time point, uh, what would happen if I just removed treatment at the last time point? 
but you can imagine there are tons of other ways to think about effects, to formalize effects, and I think in practice it will depend on the scientific question, right? Uh, which effect we're interested in is determined by, by the science. <clears throat> any questions about any of that stuff? Is that mostly a review? Or not necessarily? It's probably a review for 30% of you, I would think. Okay. Yeah, feel free to, to stop me at any point. Um, okay, so these are all, uh, they're all functionals. They're all uh, things that take in, right, they depend on the um, uh, distribution of the potential outcomes in some way, right? Um, so for example, the average human effect, this depends on the uh, marginal distribution of y1 and y0. So you can think of this as being like a map from that distribution of potential outcomes to the reals. Uh, and in general, we could, this doesn't have to be some re real value, it could be a function like the dose response curve or some other complex thing. Um, but it, these are all maps from some counterfactual distribution that we have used to hypothesize our, um, our effect of interest, uh, but we don't actually get to sample from in general, right? So we never see, for example, uh, for any given person, both their potential outcomes at least in general. Right, so if I take treatment, we get to see what happens to me under treatment, but we don't get to see what would have happened to me under control. Um, so we have this sort of missing data problem. Um, right, so to estimate any of these things, we're going to have to make some extra assumptions to be able to link them to the observed data distribution that we sample from. Maybe we should just take a, can we take a five minute break where at the tables, the students explain what potential outcomes are and, and so on. I suspect there's these little pockets of people who have never seen this but aren't saying anything. So why don't we just take five minutes and at your collective tables have a little discussion. Do we understand what potential outcomes are, right? Slide. We were a little confused about for local ATV, what is being conditioned on? Yeah, I didn't actually define this yet, so that's a completely fair question. Um, so here, this is a like an instrumental variable setup where, uh, so you should, the classic example of this is uh, an experiment where you randomize people to take treatment or control, but then they don't actually do what they're told. So by randomizing them to take treatment, but they decide to take control, say. Um, and so here, uh, because of this sort of non-compliance, we have uh, the possibility of confounding, even though we're in an experiment, because the treatment that people actually took is not the one I randomized it to. So the actual treatment assignment is no longer randomized here. Um, so you can think about that initial assignment as some nudge to take treatment or not. It doesn't actually force them to take treatment or not, but it's some uh, some nudge to, to do it. You would think that if you're randomized, you're at least more likely to take treatment than not. Um, and so this X is an instrument in this case. This is a, uh, called an instrumental variable. Uh, and so it turns out that under some some assumptions in this kind of setup, you can still estimate causal effects even when you have non-compliance, but they're limited in the sense that they're only causal effects in a subgroup of people. And so here, the superscript on A is uh, another, in this case, a potential treatment. Uh, that they, they would have had if they were either randomized to treatment or control. So one means they're actually randomized to treatment, and zero means they're randomized to control. And so this uh, effect would be a causal effect among the people who do what they're told. People who, when they're randomized to treatment, they take treatment. When they're randomized to control, they take control. Uh, and this instrumental variable thing also comes up in observational studies. Um, there, the assumptions don't necessarily hold by design like they do in an experiment, but um, yeah, so that's, that's what this means. But I think I was mostly just trying to, yeah, I, I guess we'll talk more about this, this later, but yeah, great question. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, it, if you don't understand potential outcomes, that's not the end of the world because pretty soon we're going to leave causal inference and go straight to estimation. So uh, we won't be completely lost. Um, 
which we'll get. So right, uh, the main problem in causal inference is we have this, uh, we have a parameter that's defined in terms of potential outcomes, uh, but we don't get to see at least all of the potential outcomes in practice. And so we have to link uh, this parameter to something we can actually estimate from the data that we collect. Um, so if you think about, uh, we have some causal parameter, I'll call it size star, which is a map. You know, it takes in, it depends on the uh, counterfactual distribution, which I'll call P star, so this is like the distribution of Y1 and Y0. Um, now we want to try and write this as uh, a parameter that only depends on the distribution we actually sample from. So let's imagine we can sample from the distribution P. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, that's better. Yeah. So psi star. That's our causal parameter. It's a function of the uh, distribution of the counterfactuals causal distribution. Now we want to try and write this as uh, in a, a new way, express this in a way that uh, only depends on the, the distribution P that we actually sample from. So I'm imagining here that we can sample from this distribution P. Uh, right, and, and now once we've made this link, then we can, uh, then we have a pure statistics problem on our hand and we can sort of forget that we're in the, the causal problem at all in some, some sense. Uh, so this process of linking the causal parameter to Something we can actually estimate from data that we collect that depends on the distribution we sample from is called identification. So if we can make this link, then we can say, and it's unique, then we can say that the causal uh, parameter is identified. Um, so this is just kind of saying what I just said. So again, we want to write this causal uh, quantity in terms of uh, the distribution of data that we, that we actually collect. And so the, the way I think about this is we have some counterfactual population uh, distribution, say. We have an observational population and distribution key. Identification links these two things, and then we can sample from the observational population. And because of this link, then we actually learn something about the causal quantity. So this is the, the main idea, and then I'll go through some examples here, um, which hopefully will make it more clear. Um, and so to make this link, we always are going to need some extra assumptions or we'll be, have to use the, um, you know, the fact that we did an experiment or something. Um, okay, so uh, in this, right, the, the classic example is an average treatment effect. This is the, that expected value of y1 minus y0. What would the mean outcome be if I gave everyone treatment versus no one treatment? So if we assume uh, positivity, so this is saying uh, everyone has some chance of receiving uh, treatment level little a in this case. Um, Right? You can't have any hope at estimating what would happen if everyone received treatment level uh, A, if there are some people who have zero chance of receiving that. Right? So this rules that out. Uh, consistency, uh, so this says. I have to yeah, yeah. So if A is continuous, how would you formulate the probability? Yeah, that's a great question. So you could assume like the, dense, the conditional density was bounded away from zero, say. Um, yeah, with continuous treatments, the positivity assumption is, can be very strong. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really interesting line of research. So I, I, I like in those cases thinking about stochastic kind of interventions where we say instead of what would happen if uh, we forced everyone to take treatment level three, and, you know, and three is some continuous dose, uh, instead maybe we say, uh, what would happen if we took the distribution of treatments and just shifted it up or down or something? Um, yeah. um, right, so uh, consistency, this says that uh, when you take treatment, I get to see your potential outcome under treatment. This sort of sounds like, uh, like it can't be violated, like it has to be true, but um, there are lots of examples where it can. So, uh, for example, uh, vaccine trials. Right? In that case, your potential outcomes depend on everyone else's treatment assignments, not just your own. So that's a case where this kind of consistency assumption would be uh, violated. Right? So if you guys all get vaccinated and I don't, uh, right, I would see some benefit from that. And so my potential outcome really depends on what happens to all of you guys, not just me. Uh, and then here, this is maybe the sort of crucial assumption, uh, no one measure confounding, so this says, 
We demonstrate a covariance. The treatment A is as good as randomized. It's independent of any of the potential outcome information. So in a trial or an experiment, this would happen by design because uh, the treatment is just a coin flip. So it can't depend on any, anything else. Uh, but in observational studies, you would have to collect sufficiently relevant covariates, and you'd never really know fully that this is true, so you'd have to do some sort of sensitivity analysis and see what happens to your estimates if you explore some deviations away from this kind of condition. Um, but under these assumptions, uh, it's pretty straightforward to show that we can actually write uh, causal effects in terms of, or at least uh, some version of causal effects in terms of the observed data uh, distribution that we, we sample from. So, uh, for example, if we look at the regression function, so this is the, the regression of y, it's the outcome on covariates of treatment. So if we use consistency, once we're looking at people who receive treatment level little a, we actually get to see their potential outcomes under that treatment level. So the observed outcome equals the potential outcome under that treatment level. So here we use the consistency assumption. And now, uh, under the known metric confounding assumption, right, because we're conditioning on x here, uh, in the second line, in the second equation, right, the treatment is, is actually independent of the potential outcomes. So we can condition on whatever treatment level we like here. This is always going to be the same function of x. Uh, and we could also just not condition on, on a at all. That's just by the, that conditional independence. And so now we have uh, this result that tells us the, this regression function, this regression of the outcome on covariates and treatment, actually equals the uh, uh, conditional uh, mean potential outcome under treatment level little a. And we use the uh, positivity assumption right, in, uh, so that this uh, conditioning set is, is well defined, right? so it's not a measure zero set. And so uh, right now we could average over this conditional mean to get marginal means, for example, to get the, the uh, average treatment effect type parameter of the expected value of y1. Um, now it will be the regression function at a given value little a, and then we average over the marginal distribution of, of x, say. Uh, right, so this just shows in a few steps how you can go from some sort of causal parameter to, to one that's just purely statistical. It's, it's purely expressed in terms of the observed data distribution p. And now we just have a pure stats problem on we have a parameter here, which uh, right, we're getting because we're interested in the causal effect, but we've now defined it purely statistically, and we, we just want to estimate it as well as we can. Um, and so that's sort of the, the kind of flavor of identification that you'll see. A lot of the identification results, I think, are somewhat similar. Uh, they can be much more complicated in, in some settings. but. So here's uh, a time varying version of, of what we just did. So if you assume, right, so now we have covariates. Uh, instead of just covariates treatment outcome, we have covariates treatment, and then more covariates collected, more treatments, and everything's changing over time. Everything can influence everything in the future. Uh, right, so here, if we assume everyone has some chance of receiving each treatment level, say, at each time, that's the time varying version of positivity. If we assume again, if you received a given treatment sequence, we get to see your potential outcome under that given treatment sequence. And then if we assume something like known measured confounding at each time point, so at each time, given all the past, the treatment is as good as randomized. It's independent of potential outcomes. Um, then we can do exactly what we did before in some iterated way. Um, and you get a slightly more complicated estimate here, if that's OK. Uh, right, so now the mean potential outcome under any given treatment sequence under these assumptions <coughs> looks like a regression function that's averaged not just over the one covariate distribution, but over all the covariate distributions at each time, like given all the past. Um, right, so it's more complicated here. This parameter is more, more messy, uh, but it's uh, right. The right hand side is just in terms of the distribution p that we actually sample from. That's sort of the important point. So we've made this link, and now we have a pure stats problem. We just want to try and estimate this, this parameter, which under these causal assumptions equals the causal thing that we're trying to get at. 
so you can do this. Uh, here's the sort of instrumental variable uh, version of this argument. Uh, maybe I won't go through all these details unless people are just very happy to talk after afterwards if, if you want to chat. Um, but again, under some instrumental variable type assumptions, you get that the, this conditional effect, this effect among people who actually respond to, uh, for example, randomization, people who do what they're told in, in an experiment, um, we can estimate the effect among them, and it looks like a ratio of causal effects in this case. And this is using kind of the same logic that we used uh, before, uh, a few more, more assumptions. Um, but I think for the purposes of this talk, the, unless people are specifically interested in this, the identification results themselves are not that important. The important thing is just that we're taking a causal quantity, we're making some extra assumptions, and then we're using those assumptions to write our target parameter in terms of the observed data, and then we have a pure statistics problem. Now we just want to estimate that thing as well as we can. So here's another IB example you can go through. So uh, yeah, I think identification is a huge part of causal inference. It's something I don't work on personally that much, but it's obviously very important. Um, I sort of like this uh, potential outcomes way of doing it, but there are really neat uh, graphical criteria that you can use to establish whether certain kinds of causal parameters can be identified or not from a, a graph that you specify. Um, right, and a lot of times you can't actually make this link, uh, right? You're not, maybe you're not comfortable with the known measured confounding assumption or one of these IV assumptions you think doesn't hold. And in that case, maybe you can't write your causal quantity that you want to estimate purely in terms of the observed data. And maybe that happens actually uh, more often than it doesn't. Um, so in that case, uh, you can sort of, uh, you have a couple of choices, I guess. Uh, so one approach that I like is to uh, combine sort of bounds and sensitivity analysis. So we might be comfortable with some assumptions, and we can see what those assumptions imply about the parameter that we're interested in. So maybe we can't actually write it purely as a single quantity that, uh, right, expressible in terms of the distribution we sample from, but maybe we can say it has to be bounded between, say, two numbers that we can write in terms of the distribution we sample from. And then uh, all the stuff we're going to talk about just applies to those two numbers, the, the bounds instead of the parameter itself. Um, yeah, so you should, uh, I think, in a lot of ways, those cases are not that different from the ones that we'll talk about where we assume that we have identified everything because in cases where you can't, you can try and identify bounds, um, right? Or you, you specify, instead of saying, uh, I believe in no unmeasured confounding, you say, okay, uh, there can be some unmeasured confounding, but it can't be more than some delta amount, say. And then you can uh, get bounds under that kind of assumption and see how uh, things change with different deltas. But in these cases, then you're, in my view anyways, the parameters just change from your actual target to bounds on the target. And they're still just things that you estimate from the observed data distribution. Um, in, the, in the bounds case though, these parameters are often more difficult than the cases I'll talk about here because they often have some non-smoothness. Uh, so Eric has done groundbreaking work on, on estimating these kinds of things. Um, it's non-smooth parameters. Okay. Uh, so that's all about identification. Um, I really like having this strict separation between the causal part of the problem and the statistical part of the problem. I find it, uh, it just, I don't know, maybe I'm slow or something, but it makes me, uh, it makes it much more clear for me to, to think about things this way. Um, but somehow I, I think the causal part of the problem is determined by the scientific question. Um, right? I think that should be telling us what we should be trying to estimate uh, what kind of assumptions we could make for identification, uh, but I don't think it tells us anything about how, how we should be estimating a parameter. And so to me, the causal part of the question defines the target, but then once we've defined the target, then we just want to use all the statistical tools we can to try and estimate it as well as we can. And those things to me are, are completely separated. Um, but I think in practice, uh, not everyone thinks this way. Um, so a lot of times people just sort of start modeling observed data and then make some causal uh, claims about that, um, right? So you're sort of mixing the statistical and causal aspects. Or um, this is maybe more arguable, but uh, right? or you make some some assumptions, some causal assumptions that 
put some restrictions on your observed data. So maybe you assume uh, some sort of parametric model for the way confounding works or something. Um, we'll talk some more about this a little bit later. But in general, I like to just try and keep the stats side and the causal side as separate as possible. Um, it just helps me think more clearly about these problems. Right, so uh, in these kinds of contexts, right, now I sort of draw a line dividing the causal part of the problem from the stats problem. So once I've made this link, I now have a, a statistical parameter. And to me, uh, there's often no reason really to think about the causal part of the problem once you've made this link. Um, then you can sort of forget that you're doing causal inference and just try and estimate that thing as well as you possibly can. Um, and so I think of this as just a pure functional estimation problem. We have some functional, it's defined in terms of the distribution we sample from, and uh, we want to try and optimally estimate that thing. Does that make sense? So there, there are also lots of functional estimation problems that aren't causal at all, and all the tools that we're going to talk about here are equally useful there. Uh, so you see sort of the classical, uh, classical functional, um, this is probably the one we know most about actually, is the integrated squared density. It's probably the most boring functional, but it's, uh, it's a functional. Uh, it doesn't have any neat sort of causal interpretation. Uh, then there are things like entropy, uh, support size is an interesting non-smooth functional. Uh, mutual information, people use these a lot of times in, in machine learning, uh, sort of along the way when uh, using certain tools or doing hypothesis testing. Or, um, independence testing or something. Um, and yeah, all the, all the stuff that we'll talk about is, is useful for these kinds of functionals as well. Um, it doesn't have to be a causal functional, but that just happens to be the kind of functional that I tend to work with. Um, there is a, there's an interesting problem I recently started working on, uh, which is a capture-recapture problem. So here you're trying to estimate the, you have a bunch of lists of, uh, of people, um, say. So the application that, that I've been familiar with is one where uh, you're trying to estimate the total death toll um, from the Civil War in Syria. And so people have multiple lists of uh, names of people who have died. Um, and there's some overlap across the list. And they want to try and use these lists to estimate the uh, total number of people that have died. And so this is a functional estimation problem as well. And it's almost like a causal problem. Um, so there's, there may be some complex underlying uh, process that uh, determines who's on what list, right? We, we might have a bunch of co information for each person on the list, uh, but we don't care about modeling that whole process well. What we care about doing is just estimating that population size well, um, that one number, which is the total population size. Uh, and we actually need some extra assumptions, uh, just like in causal inference, something like independence across lists, for example, to make any progress there. Um, so that's another interesting non-causal functional estimation problem. Uh, but yeah, all this stuff is, is useful in general for functional estimation. All right, so I feel like I've said this about 20 times, but now we have a pure stats problem. We can sort of forget we were ever doing causal inference. Uh, and so we, I'm going to think about uh, a setup where we, uh, we have an IID sample. So this, um, right, this is often not true, but let's pretend like, pretend like it is. Um, so we can sample from this distribution P. <clears throat> and uh, so now we need um, a notion of a statistical model. Uh, so I think this is sort of a set of assumptions or a set of distributions that's consistent with our assumptions. Uh, I'll talk about some examples of this in just a, a second. Um, right, and we have, a, we have our target, we have our parameter, and now we just want to construct an estimator. So we want to construct some, uh, something that eats up the data and spits out a guess at our parameter that has the best properties possible. Um, and so you could do this in any number of ways in theory. So you could use uh, right, parametric models and maximum likelihood or Bayes. Uh, you could do some sort of non-parametric uh, plug-in approach. Uh, I'll talk about exactly what this means. Um, or you could do some sort of, uh, this is a horrible name. If anyone has better names for, for what I'll talk about, uh, please send them to me. <laughs> <laughs> influence function based uh, approach for, for estimating this. So this is like a bias corrected um, way to estimate a, a parameter, which you can show has nice minimax properties. This is what we'll talk about for the rest of the time. Um, some, so uh, some people call this double machine learning. 
uh, other people call it targeted learning. These are a little bit too buzzwordy for me, I think, but uh, they're probably better than influence function based. So, uh, but yeah, so I'm going to try and advocate for this this approach and explain exactly what, what it means. But it's an alternative to using uh, maximum likelihood or, or some sort of generic non parametric approach. Right. Um, okay, so before we talk about uh, exactly what that means and how, uh, you know, we're, we're basically going to have uh, two parts to the, the rest of the talk. So the first part is going to be uh, how well can we possibly estimate a, a functional period? How well, how well can we estimate a parameter side? Um, what's the best possible performance we could get? And then the second part will basically be how can we construct estimators that actually attain that best possible performance. And so these are two separate questions. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to go through some sort of stats review just to make sure everybody's on the, on the same page. Uh, right, so, uh, and, and yeah, please, I feel like I'm talking too much, so please feel free to, to stop it at any point. Um, okay, are we good with everything so far? So now we'll do some, some review and then go through what's the best we can do and how do we construct estimators that that hit these bounds. All right, so uh, an estimator, right, this is just something that uh, takes in data and spits out a number, um, right? It's just a map from the, the sample to the real say. And so we're gonna be talking a lot about estimators that take the form of a sample average, um, at least in, in large samples, approximately. Um, and so I'm gonna use this PN notation uh, just so I don't have to keep writing sums and indices and things, but this just means the sample average, if you haven't seen it before. Um, so the PN of some uh, quantity means you average that quantity over the sample. It's pretty simple. Okay, so for example, PN of Z would just be the sample mean of Z. Uh, so we'll need some notion of uh, asymptotic behavior, so we'll use big O and little o notation here. Um, Right, so if we say a random variable is big O of one, we mean it stays bounded as the sample size grows. Um, right, if we say uh, a random variable is little, little P of one, that means not only is it bounded, but it's going to zero. Right, so these are just, has everyone seen these before? Yeah, X, X in is big O P of one means it's bounded, little O P means it's bounded and it's going to zero. <clears throat> and then we'll have to use some measure of distance between functions. Uh, so I'll mostly be using this L2P norm, which just looks at the, the difference, say, let's, let's think about an estimator f hat of some function f. Uh, so this looks at the difference between our estimator and our target f, squares it, averages it, and takes a square root. Um, so this is just a way of measuring how far apart f hat is from f. And I'll use the P notation here. Uh, I think I define this later as well, but um, just to mean we're averaging over the argument of a function, uh, but not over the, so if that hat is constructed from, from the sample, we're not uh, taking an expectation over that at all. Uh, right, so this quantity of that hat depends on the sample, would itself be random? Because when we're, uh, we're not taking any expectation over the sample that was used to construct that hat. It's just uh, a general way of measuring distance between functions. Uh, I, you could also use like a soup norm. I don't think I'm gonna actually use this. Um, okay, so yeah, this is a picture which I, I've, I've shown my undergrad regression class and I like keeping in mind. Uh, right, so we have a bunch of different Canada estimators in general for any given problem, uh, and they're not all gonna behave the same way. Um, and so we can try and think about right where they lie in this kind of uh, character characterization. So we can imagine, uh, right, the, I guess the ideal case is an estimator, I don't know, I always think about estimation as basically like throwing bullseyes, or throwing uh, uh, darts at a bullseye, right? So our target is the bullseye. We were trying to throw darts that are uh, hitting the bullseye Right, precisely and not, right, so we're aimed at the right direction and we're getting close every time. So that's the top left panel. You can imagine someone who's, uh, right, they're really precise, but they're off, right, they're not hitting the right target. So uh, that's this bottom left panel. Uh, I might typically think of this as being something like 
when you assume some very simple parametric model or you make lots of assumptions, you might be hitting some target really precisely, but it might not be the right one because there's some bias from your model assumptions. Um, you could also think about right, the top right panel. This is uh, like an estimator that's aiming at the right thing in general, but it's uh, not as efficient as it could be, maybe. Uh, and the bottom right panel means you're just way off. You're not doing anything right. Uh, but right, so our, we have a bunch of different candidate estimators for these problems, and we want to try and find some guarantees that let us uh, feel good that we're something like in the, the top left. You know, right? We'll be hitting our target uh, and, and with precision. And so uh, one way to uh, to quantify this is with uh, rate of convergence of a, an estimator. And so we say uh, that an estimator psi hat has a rate of convergence Rn if when we scale by Rn, the difference between psi hat and its target is, is bounded in probability. Um, and so it, this is like saying that psi hat, right, the estimator minus its target, behaves like 1 over R. And so uh, in, in sort of nice problems, uh, Rn will typically be something like the square root of n. And so this, if we know that our estimator is rooted and consistent, that would be telling us that the error basically uh, behaves like 1 over root n with some constants also attached. And we want this to be going to 0 as we imagine uh, obtaining larger sample sizes, and we hope this is going to zero as, as fast as possible. Um, right, so this is telling us how, how quickly our estimator is clustering around its target. Uh, this is something like the dartboard picture. Uh, so why do we care about this? Uh, we care because right, if we have this kind of, if we know that our estimator is clustering as fast as possible. That means we're getting as much, we're soaking up as much information from the data as we possibly can, uh, right? So we can construct tighter confidence intervals. We get more out of samples uh, without collecting more data necessarily. Right, so this is the primary goal of, of stats in some ways. Any questions about this? Right, so here's just a plot of some uh, kind of typical convergence rates that you might see. So on the x-axis, we have sample size, large sample sizes. That doesn't oh, extra log factor doesn't seem to matter too much. And smaller sample sizes, it could. Uh, we have into the quarter another common rate that you'll see. Uh, so here, right, if you look at say the error for uh, that into the quarter convergence rate. So here we're imagining an estimator with an into the quarter convergence rate. The error, say, a, a sample size of something like. Uh, 10,000 looks like the error for a root and consistent estimator at a sample size of a couple hundred, maybe. Right? Um, so this is what having a faster convergence rate buys us. Right? We can sort of get the same information out of a few hundred samples than that we would from uh, you know, 10,000 samples with a slower convergence rate estimator. <coughs> So we'll also talk about uh, asymptotic normality right, a lot. So we say an estimator is rooted and consistent and asymptotically normal if it's rooted and consistent. And after you, uh, yeah, so it's rooted and consistent. And the estimator itself behaves like a sample average plus some negligible error asymptotically. Um, and sample averages, we know, converge to uh, Normal distributions by the central limit theorem, so it will be asymptotically normal in that case. Uh, so this is also the first time we start using the, the term influence function. So we say an estimator has an influence function phi in this case if it behaves like a sample average of phi. So the estimator uh, the estimator minus the target looks like a sample average function p plus some negligible error. Um, so if, if this is true, then we say this estimator has an influence function p. <coughs> There's this confusing point, which is you can talk about influence functions for estimators, and you can also talk about influence functions for parameters. Um, and they're not always the same thing, uh, so we'll define the latter uh, later on. Uh, but when we say estimator has an influence function, we, means, we mean just that it behaves as a sample average of that function. 
Um, yeah, so this is, uh, in my view, typically is, is the best we can hope for. In a lot of cases, we might not have a really consistent estimator at all, um, but if we can find one that I think in most problems means that we've done as well as we could. Um, and you can imagine if you have multiple estimators that are rude and consistent, you'd want to pick the one that has the smallest asymptotic variance, say. Um, this happens uh, only in proper semi-parametric models where you're putting some extra restrictions beyond a, non a fully non-parametric model. That's the only case you get multiple rude and consistent uh, uh, asymptotically normal estimators. Um, and uh, yeah, often, this may not even be possible. We won't really talk about that much um, today. Uh, and in non-parametric models, fully non-parametric models, there will only be one estimator, at most one estimator, that has this property that's rooted and consistent and asymptotically normal. So if you're working in a non-parametric model and you find this, then you can sort of stop and know that you're, you've done as well as you can, generally. Uh, this is one of the reasons I like non-parametric models, because I'm sort of lazy and I don't want to think about all the rooted and consistent estimators up there. <coughs> Okay, so um, right, another thing that will be lurking in the background throughout this whole uh, talk is the cursive dimensionality, right? So this says, uh, as we have, uh, say, more and more covariates, our statistics, statistical methods have to degrade in some sense, right? Uh, there's some cost from this, unless we're adding some extra assumptions to handle it. Um, so I think a sort of nice, simple way to think about this is if you imagine just trying to estimate a regression function, so uh, right, the expected uh, uh, outcome given covariates, and you're willing to assume that this function is uh, has beta derivatives, it's like beta smooth. Okay. Um, and we say that x has, say, say d components, so maybe 10 components or something, and we're, we're willing to say that uh, there are you know, beta equal 3 derivatives or something. Um, so this is a way of characterizing how hard this function is. The more Derivatives, we, we assume it has, the easier it becomes to estimate. Um, there's a, a sort of classical result which says, uh, it's a minimax result, it says the best possible convergence rate uh, among all possible estimators of regression functions, if you're just assuming that they're beta smooth, they have beta derivatives, uh, looks something like n to the minus beta over 2 beta plus d. Right, so if you, if we parse this result, so here, this is uh, right, just the sort of like the measure of, of uh, error of an estimator mu hat of this regression function. Right? And now we're looking at the worst case error. We want to try and make some guarantee about how we're going to do in the worst case. We want to protect ourselves against that worst case setup. So you, you should think about this right, soup over over this error as just being the, the worst case error. This is what we want to uh, control. And then we, we can look at how this uh, error behaves over all possible estimators, and we can look at the minimum possible error for every estimator you could possibly construct for a regression function. Okay. Any function that takes in the data and spits out a regression function estimate. Um, right? And so this is a, a classic result, non-parametrics, that this has to be uh, uh, at least as, as big as, uh, as this. So it, it has to behave like n to the minus beta over 2 beta plus d. At best, right? we can't do any better than that for any estimator unless we have assumptions. Uh, right? So if you just think about a few examples, in the case where we just have a single covariate, even if we assume uh, a thousand derivatives, this is still going to be slower than root n. So this says something about how, how hard it is to do non-parametric estimation of, say, a regression function. Um, Right? And in practice, right, maybe we have something more like 20 covariates, and maybe we're just willing to assume, say, one derivative. We don't want to assume too much smoothness. Uh, then we get something like an n to the minus 1 over 20 rate, okay, which is very slow. That's slower than anything we showed on that plot earlier. Um, right? So in general, non-parametrics is hard. And as you increase dimension uh, or uh, increase complexity in some sense, right? in this case, decrease smoothness, uh, the problem gets harder. Right? So the, the beautiful thing about functionals, about estimating uh, things that are sort of structured combinations of probability distributions rather than just these fundamental pieces like regressions, regression functions, or density functions, is that you can, uh, you can get much faster rates than this. So these 
minimax type rates for regression functions don't uh, don't apply to uh, functionalization. Uh, so it's sort of a beautiful thing. You can use the, the fact that you're interested in, in some uh, feature of the probability distribution to do really well, and even in non parametric models, that can be very complex. Okay, so uh, right, let's talk about, uh, I think that's the end of the, the review. Uh, now let's talk about different choices we, we could have for constructing estimators here. Um, right, so we could assume some parametric model. We could just uh, specify some big, uh, big parametric model. So that means assuming that our, say, our whole probability distribution or the relative components, or the important components, just depend on some finite dimensional uh, parameter. So they're known completely up to some finite dimensional parameter. Um, right? And then uh, under some, some smoothness and regularity conditions, we know that the MLE will be optimal. Um, Minimax optimal, uh, but the issue is here. Often we don't want to make these assumptions, right? Often we we don't actually know the exact form for some, uh, you know, the, the way that the data is generated up to only you know ten parameters, right? The the problem might be much more complex than that, uh, right? So even the regression function case, uh, you can see how much this kind of assumption is is buying you. Uh, and even if you assume essentially infinite smoothness, you're not getting a root in rate. Um, uh, if you put in a, a parametric model, you would you would obviously get a, a root in rate there. Um, right. So this is uh, this is one limitation that I, I want to try to address. Just that this is often a strong assumption to say I know the exact functional form of say a regression function or multiple regression functions and densities up to uh, a few parameters. Um, Another issue is that doing this could uh, actually discard something that you, you know about the data. So if you think about um, an experiment, uh, there you actually know the way that treatment is assigned. You know it's a coin flip. But if you use a likelihood-based approach, uh, you sort of ignore that fact. It factors out of the likelihood. So somehow it's not using the right information that you actually, you actually know. Um, yeah, so I would sort of think about, in general, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I don't want to discount all parametric models, but in general, if you're using a sort of very simplistic parametric model, I would sort of roughly think of being in that bottom left corner, uh, unless we have good reason to believe the, the assumptions. Right, so uh, that would su suggest doing something more flexible, right? Maybe uh, thinking about a, a parametric model where we uh, have lots of parameters set, we keep adding parameters, and then I, I think of that as a non parametric approach, really. If we are using the data in some sort of adaptive way to pick how many parameters in our model, I think of that as being a, a non-parametric approach where we aren't getting root in rates. Uh, but in general, we could uh, try and think about some, some more flexible way to, to estimate our, our parameter. And the most, right, the, the simplest thing to do would be to just construct some estimator, some initial estimator of the entire probability distribution and plug it in to our definition of our parameter, right? That's sort of the simplest thing you could possibly do. Um, it, it seems like a fine approach. Um, right, so that's, that's what I'll call a plug-in estimator. So we just write some, right, we have some expression for our parameter, and then we, right, the only thing we don't know is, is P, so we estimate P, put a hat on it, and then we define the parameter, that, or an estimator that way, a plug-in estimator. So uh, yeah, this is a really simple sort of intuitive thing to do, uh, but it's, it can be highly suboptimal. So uh, in general, these kinds of estimators won't be, uh, for example, root inconsistent. Um, so this is very different from the parametric case, right? In the parametric case, when you do this, uh, everything sort of works out beautifully. In the non-parametric case, that's not true in general. Um, so we, if we do this, we end up getting estimators that generally are not root inconsistent, uh, they don't give us valid confidence intervals, right? So we're sort of stuck here. Um, there are a few special cases where if you sort of tune uh, your estimate P in exactly the right way, you can get a plug-in estimator that has some nice properties. Um, but in general, that, that won't work. Uh, so let's think about uh, this boring functional of the integrated density squared. 
right? It's somehow it's not that practically interesting, but it's such a simple functional that you can see a lot of the deep ideas um, that you see in more complicated functionals, and it's just easier to talk about. Um, right, so this is the integral of the density squared. Right, so a plug-in estimator, for example, would be one that just uh, you could construct. Right, see you later. <laughs> So, uh, right so far, we we're going to try and steer clear of a, a parametric approach just to see what we can do without making those assumptions. And then, uh, right, the next thing you might think about doing if you weren't using a parametric model would be to just take your parameter defi definition and plug in some initial estimator p hat, and then use that as your estimator, and that's called a plug-in estimator. And so now we'll just uh, think about how that works in a simple example. Um, the integrated density squared. And so a natural plug-in estimator here would be, right, this is just the expected, the parameter is defined as the expected value of the density. And so you could naturally estimate this by estimating the density, say with the kernel density estimator, and then taking a sample average of that estimator. So that's what the plug-in is doing. You could also think about a plug-in estimator that takes the density, an estimate of the density squares and then integrates. Uh, that will have the same sort of behavior as, as this estimator. Uh, does everybody, does that make sense what this estimator is doing? So this is a, just a natural sort of plug-in estimator, right? We take our parameter, uh, and we put hats on everything we don't know. Um, and so we'll see in the next, um, the next part of the talk that uh, we have this nice uh, breakdown. So yeah, I'll talk much more about this, but for this estimator, we can write it as so this uh, first term is a really nice, simple uh, sample average. So the, the p notation, I, I sort of defined it earlier. Uh, so when I write p of, say, some function f, f of x, say, this means uh, the expected value of that function over its arguments. So if f is a fixed function, this is just going to be like the expected value of f. But it will uh, differ when f is estimated, say it depends on the sample. Then this will be an expected value of that estimated thing just over its argument. So it's like what you would see if you drew new samples, evaluated this uh, estimator uh, on, on each of those samples, but you kept the same estimator. So it's kind of like conditioning on the data you use to construct that hat and just taking an expectation over its arguments. Um, so this will be a really useful kind of notational trick to use. Uh, so this first term here, this is just a sample average which is centered because we're subtracting off the mean of the density. So I'm, I'm taking out arguments here just for simplicity. And so that first term is going to be nice and asymptotically normal by the central limit here. It's just a centered sample average of a fixed function. The second term is the sort of contribution from estimating the density. Uh, and then we have some little error, which we'll talk about where that came from soon. Uh, but that, so the first term is really nice. Uh, if we could kill that second term, then we'd be in great shape. We'd have a root in consistent estimator that's asymptotically normal. But the issue is because we didn't especially tailor this estimator, we just used the simple plugin. This uh, this extra term, which is like a bias term, it's like a the bias you get from estimating the density. Uh, in general, is going to be non-negligible. Right. So again, this first term is nice, behaves like a it is a, a centered sample average, behaves like one over root n. But the second one, this is uh, right. We could upper bound it, for example, by this. Uh, L2 distance between the estimator and the density. And then we know that this thing, we know what the minimax rates are for this, this thing. Uh, they look like what they do for regression functions, which is that slow into the minus beta over 2 beta plus d rate if we assume the density has beta derivatives. And so in general, we wouldn't expect for this thing to be, to be small. We would expect it to be uh, slower than root n. Uh, consistent, and so that term would dominate this uh, this whole expression, and we wouldn't get uh, a rooted consistent estimator. We wouldn't have 
a nice limiting distribution in general. Does that make sense? So here I would think about, so this thing will be consistent as long as p hat is consistent. It'll be converging to the right target, but it's converging at a slow rate because of this bias term. Um, but So I would think about this as being sort of in the top right panel here, where we're going to be, we're sort of aiming at the right thing, but we're not, uh, we don't have the fastest convergence rate. And it's going to be something like n to the minus 1 over 20 if we have a 20 dimensional uh, density rate. Um, so there is there is one exception here, uh, or, or I guess this is kind of a general uh, issue, but there are ways to make a plug-in estimator um, efficient and sort of optimal, root and consistent, for example, in this case. So, uh, but we're going to see that they require some strong assumptions. They require you to, you to use uh, specific estimators, uh, and you have to tune them in a very careful way. That's hard to do in practice. These are three big disadvantages. So if we assume that this density is uh, beta smooth, again, that's beta derivatives, and we use a specific kernel estimator that looks like this. This is just the usual kernel estimator of the density. Uh, you can actually show that this uh, that problematic bias term that we were looking at that was killing our expansion earlier, that was ruining our chances at root inconsistency, uh, actually does look like 1 over root n. It looks like a centered sample average. Uh, but uh, for to show this result, you have to use the fact that uh, you have to use a higher order kernel, so you can't just use any kernel. And you have to under smooth, so you, you can't pick the bandwidth in this kernel estimator using cross validation, for example. You have to pick a bandwidth that's smaller than that. In particular, it has to look like minus 1 over beta plus d. Uh, and so in a finite sample, there's going to be some constant here, and it's unclear how we should actually pick the bandwidth. We can't use cross validation to tune anymore. We need to pick it so that we uh, get a slightly more wiggly uh, density than we should get if we want to minimize the mean squared error say for the density estimator. Uh, and so it's unclear how to, how to do this. I, I sort of think of these under smoothing things as like a theoretical trick, it's something we can assume to, to get the properties we want, but it's hard to actually do it in practice. Um, right, so we have to use a specific kernel estimator, we have to under smooth, and then we also have to use a pretty strong smoothness assumption. So we have to assume that we have more derivatives in our density than the dimension of the density. It's a pretty strong uh, smoothness assumption. We'll see why that is in a bit. Uh, so those are the, the downsides here. So it is possible to, to construct a specialized plug-in estimator, at least in this case that we've seen, uh, if, you, if you use a specific estimator under smooth and make strong smoothness assumptions. Um, so you can also show something like this happens for like the causal effect functional uh, functionals, like the average treatment effect. Uh, but then there are several questions that come up here, right? So one is, uh, could we have done better than this plugin? Um, so it's it's not clear. We uh, we know if we meet all these sort of stringent condi conditions, we have a root and consistent estimator. Uh, we don't know yet actually if we've done the best we can, uh, even when this plugin is working optimally and doing well. Uh, what if we want to make uh, less stringent smoothness conditions, right? What if we don't believe that there are a bunch of derivatives, uh, uh, you know, more derivatives than the dimension? Um, it's not clear. And what if we want to use other structure? What if we don't want to use, um, what if we want to be sort of agnostic about whether the density function is uh, smooth or has some other structural properties, like maybe it's monotonic or something? Uh, Okay, here we have to fine tune our estimator for any given assumption that we're using. Uh, and then what if we don't want to use a kernel estimator, right? For any given sample, uh, it might not be the kernel estimator that does the best, it might be some other thing based on whatever the true structure of the density is. Uh, and so these kinds of issues are what are solved by using influence function based estimators and influence functions in general. They tell us, so the efficiency theory tells us the best possible performance we could hope to get, right? It gives us some lower bound for how well, how well we could do. Uh, and then it, we'll see that it also gives, a, gives us estimators that um, have some really nice properties. They can be root and consistent uh, in, in sort of uh, flexible non-parametric models. And we can be 
uh, quite agnostic about how we actually construct our estimators and what kind of uh, structural or complexity conditions we need on things like densities and regression functions. Um, so this is nice because we could use, uh, you know, we could throw a random forest or some other, uh, you know, machine learning type tools, and, and we don't have to specifically uh, use, a, say, a kernel estimator with careful tuning. Uh, we can use more more flexible tools and, and be more agnostic about uh, about the underlying structure. So we'll see uh, exactly what this means. Um, okay, so that's sort of the setup. We have a we have a parameter uh, that we want to estimate. It came from causal inference, uh, uh, possibly, uh, but now we just want to estimate the statistical parameter well. And uh, we don't want to make parametric assumptions because we think they might not hold. Uh, and we don't want to use this sort of very specific non-parametric estimator, plug-in estimator with careful tuning and strong smoothness assumptions and things. We want to see what we can do without, without that. Um, so the first task will be to figure out the lower bounds, so to see how well we can possibly estimate these functionals. Um, so that's what the next part is about. Um, right, so to figure this out, we have to say what our model is. We have to say what, what kind of assumptions we're making, uh, what kind of uh, distributions we're allowing to be the one that generated the, the data. Um, right, so in the parametric case, we assume this is indexed by some uh, function that we know up to say 10 parameters or something. Um, so a simple example would be where you're drawing uh, variables that are normal with some unknown mean and, and covariance matrix say. Um, and so uh, what's a semi-parametric model? A semi-parametric model is just uh, a statistical model that has some infinite dimensional component. It has some component where we're not putting any restrictions on the say class of, any parametric restrictions on the class of say, densities or regression functions that are coming up in, in the uh, data generating process. Right, so it basically means not, not fully parametric. Uh, so let's talk about some examples of semi-parametric models. So uh, the simplest example is just a non-parametric model that doesn't say anything about, doesn't impose any kind of parametric structure at all on the, on the class of, uh, say, densities or, or distributions. Uh, Right, so for that reason, the semi-parametric theory includes non-parametrics as a special case. The non-parametric model is, is a semi-parametric model without any kind of parametric restrictions. Um, and so the first uh, sort of papers on this stuff called these models parametric, non-parametric, uh, which I kind of like. Um, I like thinking about non-parametric models as being different from proper semi-parametric models that make some restrictions uh, rather than being a special case. Uh, all right, so another example of a semi-parametric model one would be one where we maybe we see some covariance and, and an outcome, um, and we assume some uh, parametric structure for the regression function. So we assume the conditional uh, mean of the outcome given the covariance is, say, a linear function in X. Um, but then we say that the, uh, you know, the distribution of Y given X is completely unknown, unrestricted. So this is a semi-parametric model because we're leaving that distribution completely unrestricted. We're not putting any parametric restrictions on it. Um, but this is a, a, a semi-parametric model that's somehow very close to a parametric model, right? Um, it's, it's putting a lot of parametric structure, but there's still some part that's unrestricted. And so this is called GE, or M estimation, or restricted moment model. So it's sort of a simple semi-parametric model. This is, I think, one of the interesting things about semi-parametrics. You can range from a non-parametric model where you don't assume anything to something that's almost like a parametric model, and there's everything in between as well. Um, right, so another uh, famous semi-parametric model is a COPS model. So we observe, say, covariates and some sur uh, survival time, and then we assume something about the ratio of the hazards, right? But we don't assume anything else about, say, the, the uh, baseline hazard uh, specifically. We just assume something about the ratio. So this is semi-parametric because we're putting some parametric restrictions on the, the ratio, but leaving everything else unspecified. And this is another model that's sort of very similar to a parametric model. Let's see, I think about sort of a whole spectrum of non-parametric to parametric, and this is more like a, a parametric model. Uh, so how does this come up in causal inference? So um, 
I mean, one way that uh, semi-parametric models arise in causal inference is through uh, experiments or, or randomized trials. So there we actually know the treatment process. Uh, we know it completely. So for example, we know the propensity score uh, because we assign treatment ourselves. And so that amounts to putting a restriction on the distribution P that, that uh, is generating our, our samples. Uh, uh, right, and that restriction comes because we actually intervened and we, we know we generated the data ourselves in some sense, or the treatment data. Um, Right, so in that case, we know the propensity score, but we might not want to put any restrictions on the outcome process, how the outcome depends on covariates, um, because that might be some really complex process that depends on human biology or uh, some complex social processes or something that we don't have any understanding of. Um, right, so uh, semi-parametric models arise very naturally in, in, in trials and experiments. Um, in observational settings, uh, right, you might have some, you might be able to talk to doctors and get some understanding of how they're uh, making treatment decisions. And so maybe you can uh, know the propensity score up to a few parameters, say, in that case, the way treatment is assigned. Uh, and there, so we might have some, some restriction on the propensity score on the treatment assignment process. But again, we might want to be completely agnostic about how the outcomes uh, depend on covariance, say. Right. But often, I think, probably more likely, the, the case is that we just don't know anything about the treatment assignment in an observational study. And then we might be in a non-parametric model setup where uh, we don't restrict any of the components of the distribution P that we're sampling from. So uh, I like taking this uh, perspective. I, I feel like I haven't encountered very many cases where I actually know some parametric structure. Um, uh, and uh, I'm also lazy. Non-parametric models are easier to analyze, it turns out. Um, and so, yeah, this is the sort of natural effect that uh, right, we saw that regression functions are really hard to estimate in non-parametric models. We can get very slow rates in sort of very common settings somehow. Um, but for functional estimation, uh, it turns out you can often do really well. You can construct estimators that have nice, fast rooted rates of convergence, give you nice, valid confidence intervals. Um, even if you're sort of uh, constructing these estimators in a general way using flexible tools that you don't maybe completely understand. Um, it, so we'll see how we can do this. Uh, so another way that semi-parametric models arise is when, um, I think I'm actually going to skip this. Right. Again, we want to figure out uh, how well can we possibly do. Um, this is the only way we can know whether we can stop. Right? If we don't, if we don't figure this out, then we uh, we might have an estimator, and we, we won't know uh, if we could have done better. Right? Maybe we should have kept working, kept trying to construct some other estimator. Uh, so this tells us when we can we can stop, basically. So we want some sort of lower bound or benchmark for how well we can estimate a, a parameter. That's the goal here. Uh, so first, let's just think about the parametric setup. So right, if we have a smooth parametric model, um, then we know from the classical Kramer-Rau result that if we have any unbiased estimator, right, we have a lower bound of the variance of that estimator, which just looks like the derivative of the parameter over the expected square of the score. Right? That's the classical Kramer-Rau uh, result. Uh, it turns out this is also, this is not just a lower bound for unbiased estimators, it's a lower bound in an asymptotic minimax sense. Um, so if you think this is roughly similar to the minimax type result we looked at before, it's a local minimax result, so it's a little more complicated. But uh, right, roughly, if you look at uh, all possible estimators, um, they can't have uh, uh, mean squared error better than uh, something like that came out, uh, came around lower bound. Right, so this isn't just for unbiased estimators, it's a uh, local asymptotic minimax result. Uh, right, so that's really nice. We know from this all the classical uh, MLE theory that you've probably learned uh, how to construct lower bounds in, in nice, smooth parametric models. Uh, so that's what we know, but how do we use this to find some useful lower bounds for non-parametric models? Right, that's not exactly clear. Um, so the trick that you can 
you can use is uh, to use a parametric submodel. So you construct some hypothetical submodel. Uh, we'll call it p epsilon. Uh, it's a, a parametric model. You should think about it as just depending on, say, one parameter epsilon. Um, and we want this to be contained in the uh, the full non-parametric model. Um, and then we also want it to equal the the true p zero that we're sampling from that we don't know. Uh, for some value of epsilon, say epsilon equals zero. Okay. Um, all right, so the, these are the main features of the parametric submodel. It's uh, included in our larger model and it contain, contains the, the true distribution that we're trying to estimate some functional of. So we can never use this, um, this model in practice, right? Because it's, it's gonna be some function of the, the true P0. Um, but this is, uh, that's fine. This is actually just a, a technical device that we're going to use to try and construct lower bounds in the non-parametric model. So, uh, right here's an example of a, a submodel. Um, so we have p epsilon. That's our parametric submodel. It's just a typical parametric model. Uh, it depends on one unknown parameter epsilon, but it's also a function of the true density p here, uh, which we don't know, but we're treating it as as known basically in the submodel. Uh, and then it has some uh, some other function that it involves, uh, which is h, and h is some bounded function um, that uh, turns out to act like a, a score in this in the sum. So this is just like a fluctuation around the true p, where the fluctuation depends on a, a simple uh, one-dimensional parameter epsilon. Uh, and so the really crucial fact, the reason why we do this is because if we can find a lower bound for any submodel, we automatically have a lower bound for the bigger model. And it's harder to estimate uh, a parameter in a bigger model than it is in a smaller model. So if we find some, say, minimax lower bound in a smaller model, we immediately have one for the bigger model. And this smaller model is contained in our bigger non-parametric model by construction. Right, so if we if we have a lower bound here, if we know the best possible estimator in the submodel, sub -model, the best possible performance of any estimator in the submodel, that will tell us uh, at least a lower bound on the best possible performance in the larger non-parametric model. Because it only gets harder if you make the model non-parametric. So this is a really sort of crucial point. Um, does that make sense? Right, if, we, if we can find some optimality result in a smaller model, uh, it has to apply in a larger model that's harder. Right? It may not be uh, a, a useful lower bound. right? So uh, we could find a lower bound that could never be attained in the bigger model. Right? That would be unfortunate, but it's still a valid lower bound. So now the trick is to try and find a lower bound in the submodel that uh, can actually be attained in the larger non-parametric model. OK, so if we, we could form any simple parametric submodel that we like like this, so we just pick some, uh, some score function h, some generic score uh, that has, uh, so this function has to have mean 0, so this thing is actually like a density. Uh, we could pick whatever we like, and we could look at the kramer rao lower bound for this thing, and that would immediately tell us uh, a lower bound in the, in the non-parametric model, um, just by virtue of the fact that this is a sub-model of the bigger model. But now we want to find a smart way to pick that h so that we get the best lower bound. I mean, the best lower bound is the largest lower bound. We want to try and find the one that's uh, most likely to be attained in the, in the larger non-parametric model. Um, but because of this classical MLE theory, we know how to construct lower bounds in all of these submodels. Um, and it's just the Kramer Rao bound that we gave earlier. Right, so the derivative of the functional uh, here, the derivatives with respect to epsilon, the parameter in the parametric submodel, over the expected square of the score. So this is exactly like the classical theory. We're just applying it to this device, which is that parametric submodel, uh, which we're going to use to try and extract uh, an appropriate lower bound in the larger non-parametric model. So in that submodel I gave before, that, that uh, example submodel, the score is exactly that h function. So if we pick uh, an h, 
Um, that, that thing exactly is, is the, the score. So we could think about different submodels with different scores by just picking different functions h. And we'll try and find the function h that gives us the, the best lower bound. And then, but, but it doesn't matter, right? Any h will give us a lower bound. We just want to find the best one, the one that could uh, possibly be attained. Uh, and then we'll see in the second part how to construct an estimator to see that we can actually attain that lower bound. Does the logic there make sense? Yeah, so we, we, we could easily get any lower bound, but we might get some useless lower bounds, right? The most useless lower bound is just uh, zero or something, right? Every estimator has to have some error. Uh, we can never hope to have an estimator with zero error, but it's still a valid lower bound. We want to find a lower bound that actually can be attained by some estimator. And then, then if we have a lower bound and an estimator that attains it, we're, we're done, right? Then we know that we have an estimator that uh, uh, is uh, attaining this, this lower bound, we couldn't have done any better because it's a lower bound. Yeah, I'm, I'm not completely fine, so maybe you already said this, but it's not clear to me why if we have a, so we're taking this, we're restricting our class of non-parametric models to it is the sub-parametric one, right? Right. So why if we find a lower bound in this subclass, why is that necessarily a lower bound for this greater set of possible things? Yeah, so just because the, uh, the estimation problem is harder in the, in the larger model, so we couldn't ever hope to do better in a larger model than a smaller model. Because we're only we're only adding more possibilities. We're only making it harder on ourselves. But we're expanding the class of possible estimators. Are you getting? No. So we could use any estimator, as long as it's a, it, it can be anything. It could be a map, just any function from the data that spits out a, a number. Right. But then you're saying I'm limiting myself to ones that have this sub parametric. So uh, no, actually, yeah, this, that's a great question. So this. This is a choice of submodel, but our choice of possible estimators doesn't change at all. We can use any estimator we like. Anything that takes in all the data and spits out a number, it can be anything. And for any of them, you can apply this concept to set? Yeah, because, this, because of this minimax result, this is over all possible maps from the data to the reals. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. That's a good point. So the, the choice of estimators that we're considering isn't changing here. We're just changing the, the model. And we're, we're allowing you to use any, any estimator you like that takes in the data and spits out a real number. Yeah, so it, it can only get harder by uh, making, uh, by adding in more possible uh, probability distributions that generated the, the data. If you think about it in the minimax sense, if we take, we have a, uh, a minimax result that says, right, so we maybe think about something like the mean squared error of some, some estimator uh, minus the, its target, or, or the, the estimator, right? Uh, right, so for any, any given estimator, we could think about the, the mean squared error here. Then we're going to look at the worst case because we want to protect ourselves against against the worst case, uh, and then we want to find the estimator that, that minimizes this worst case error. And this is over all possible maps from the data to the reals. And so now, if we think about some subset p uh, of p, say p zero, right? If we enlarge this. Uh, saying is, let's say we find a minimax lower bound of this form for some submodel P0. So we find a lower bound, which looks like this, so L. Uh, this thing is upper bounded by the same thing if I replace that soup over the full model, because this is a subset of this. So I'm taking a soup over a bigger list, uh, a bigger combination of things that includes this. So this is a common trick when you're finding lower bounds. You find it for some simple submodel, uh, and then that immediately applies to a, uh, applies to a larger model. And so the trick is to find 
uh, a smart submodel, basically, that is not only a, a lower bound, but one that can be attained. But yeah, so uh, we immediately get lower bounds just from the Kramer Rao whistle. <laughs> Right, so yeah, we so we have this device that we can use to give us uh, a lower bound. Uh, we know how to get lower bounds from the Kramer Rao theory, uh, and we want to do it in a smart way that gives us a lower bound. We have some hope of attaining so something that's not like a lower bound, just zero. Uh, something that we could actually uh, attain. You know, we could construct an estimator in a non-parametric model and prove that it hits that lower bound. Um, Okay, so uh, so we want to basically find the the biggest of all these lower bounds across all the possible submodels, which you can think of as just being indexed by all these H's. So we get a different submodel for every choice of, of, of that H function in our submodels row. We're fluctuating around the the true uh, P0 in some way, and, and that way depends on the, the score H. Okay, so we have to, we, our goal is to, yeah, our goal is to basically try and find the supremum of this thing, the supremum of all these bounds across all the submodels. Um, so let's just try and think about how, if we can simplify this in some way to, to make it obvious where this comes from. Uh, so let's first think about that derivative. So this is the derivative of the parameter with respect to the submodel parameter epsilon. Um, okay, so what, what can we say about this? So if uh, if this parameter is smooth enough that it has this kind of uh, von Mises type expansion, or you could think about this as a distributional Taylor expansion. And so if you sort of squint at this, you have some function of Q and P. It looks like something like a um, well, let's imagine say psi of Q this equals psi of P plus some derivative term times something like q minus p plus some second order remainder, right? This looks like, if you think about q and p as just being uh, some finite dimensional, some real numbers, this just looks like a standard Taylor expansion. So this, this is a distributional analog of the Taylor expansion. And it's a way of quantifying the smoothness of the functional that we're trying to get at. Uh, this is a really crucial thing. This basically underlies the whole way that I think about influence functions. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think this is, is really important. Um, right, so, yeah, well, maybe let's think about this a little more. So we're saying that the, the difference between the, the functional evaluated at two probability distributions can be expressed as some uh, expected value, basically, of some function, uh, phi. So this function phi, uh, it also it depends on the observation z. Uh, I'm hiding that here. Um, and it's a mean zero function with finite variance. Um, but this is just a, a definition, a way to quantify smoothness of a functional that's like a distributional analog of a Taylor expansion. Um, and so this phi is like the derivative term in this Taylor expansion. Uh, and then we have some higher order stuff that I'm hiding with this R2 notation. Um, So this, uh, you can check actually that this implies something called pathwise differentiability under some weak regularity conditions. Um, so you just evaluate this sort of Taylor expansion at uh, uh, P epsilon and P uh, and take a derivative. And that implies that the derivative of the functional with respect to this epsilon uh, looks like uh, this guy. And what is this? This is the um, the covariance between this function phi that appears in the Taylor expansion and this, the score of the submodel. Um, <clears throat> so this, to me, these two things are, are basically equivalent. Uh, this is another way of uh, expressing smoothness of the functional to say that its derivative can be expressed as in this special way that looks like, uh, so this is the expected value of phi times the score. And because phi has mean zero and the score has mean zero, this is just the covariance between this 
natural function phi and the score. Um, so how do we actually know that a functional can satisfy this kind of expansion? We have to just sort of derive it and show that it does. So we have to uh, find this function phi so that this thing works out so that we get um, this nice second order remainder. And by second order remainder, I mean that term just depends on squared differences or higher order differences between Q and V. So the, the first term is like the derivative term in a Taylor expansion. This second, the second order remainder term is like uh, something that involves like you know some distance between Q and P squared. Um, and so yeah, the way you show this is just analytically by analyzing the functional and finding this thing V, and I'll show you some tricks for doing this in, in just a little bit. Um, but yeah, sometimes in the semi-parametric literature you see pathwise differentiability expressed this way, but I sort of like to think about it this way just because it looks like a Taylor expansion. It sort of more clearly to me indicates that it's some smoothness condition on the functional. Um, but there, you should think of them as basically being equivalent. And you can get the latter from the former by just plugging in P and P epsilon and differentiating. Yeah, so this is a really, really crucial uh, thing. This is this really motivates how I think about all of this stuff. Um, so it's crucial because we'll see how it will give us lower bounds in just a minute. Uh, it's also crucial because if you imagine uh, just starting with this expansion, and instead of putting a Q here, you put in some P hat, some initial estimator P hat, and evaluating this expansion at that P hat, this tells you something about the bias of a plug-in estimator, that sort of naive non-parametric estimator we talked about. Uh, right? It gives us sort of an explicit ex uh, expression for that bias. And then we have immediately a natural way to correct that bias, which is just to estimate it and subtract it out. So I think about these influence function-based estimators, doubly robust estimators, double machine learning, targeted learning, all this stuff is a way of doing bias correction based on this uh, smoothness of the functional. So this is telling us what the bias of a plug-in looks like because we can evaluate it at q equals p hat and then estimate the bias term and subtract it out and then we're only left with the, that small order remainder term. So we'll talk about this more in a bit too. Um, uh, but this expression doesn't involve any data, right? It's just a purely analytical expression based on the, whatever the functional is. Uh, right, so for the average treatment effect uh, functional, right, this, uh, we'll see what that phi object looks like. Um, but this is, there's no data here whatsoever. This all just depends on the analytic expression for the functional. Uh, and so once you, once you find this expansion, um, then you found uh, an influence function. Uh, so this is the other way to think about influence functions. So we saw earlier what the influence function of an estimator was, and this tells us what the influence function of a parameter is. So if you can write this expression, then phi is an influence function for this parameter. So it's I think it's kind of confusing that you have the same name applying to these two slightly different concepts. We'll see that sometimes they coincide, but they don't always coincide. Uh, so I, I feel like it would be better if we called this influence curve maybe or gradient or something uh, to distinguish them. But these are the two notions of influence functions. So one is about the estimate, a particular estimator and its asymptotic behavior, and the other is about the smoothness of a functional. So it's, it, it's a property of the parameter itself, not of an estimator. So yeah, that, that distributional Taylor expansion to me buys 90% of the semi-parametric results uh, in a really meaningful way. So uh, we'll see the first half of that here. So uh, right, we want to find the supremum of, of all these kramer rao lower bounds across all submodels. That's what this is. And we can just think of this as picking different H's based on that choice of submodel we, we picked earlier. It doesn't really matter what Submodel we, we use here, uh, right? We're always going to get a valid lower bound, but we just want to try and find the best one we can. Uh, and so let's think about doing doing the supremum over all submodels of that say form earlier, where the score looks like H. So we just 
pick a different score function, that gives us a different uh, submodel. Um, and then, right, because that h is the score, we know what the denominator is. This is expected value of the square of the score, that's all this is. We're just, we know the score is h in that submodel, you can check that yourself. So take the derivative of the log of the density in that submodel and you'll find that it's h by construction. So that allows us to replace this denominator with, with h squared, because we set up our submodel specifically that way. And then the numerator comes from that smoothness condition. Right, so that smoothness condition tells us that the derivative uh, of the functional with respect to epsilon, so this, just to be clear, that when I write psi prime p epsilon, that means just the usual derivative d d epsilon of psi at p epsilon. And epsilon is just a single real value parameter, so there's nothing uh, mysterious here, it's just the usual derivative. Uh, and so the smoothness condition, that pathwise differentiability, or the Taylor, uh, the distributional Taylor expansion tells us that the derivative actually equals the covariance between that magical function phi and the score. Right? That was the definition of pathwise differentiability. So we can replace this numerator with that covariance, which is written here, squared. Um, right? And now Cauchy-Schwartz tells us this has to be less than the expected square of this phi. Great. Uh, so now we know that the lower bound has to be less than this. And now the question is whether we can find a submodel that, uh, that hits this upper bound on our lower bound. Uh, and so that will happen if we can pick um, phi uh, to be h. Great. So if we, if we can construct a submodel where h equals this magical function phi, then we know that uh, the supremum is, is attained. Uh, right? If you plug in h equals p here, then you get the, the supremum. Um, so that tells us if, if this uh, function phi is a valid submodel score, so not every function uh, phi would be a valid submodel score. We'll see some examples of this. But if it is, then, uh, then this, this bound is, is uh, attained here. And so that, uh, that tells us then this is, the, this is actually the greatest lower bound. This equals the supremum over all h. Uh, a way of saying, another way of saying that that phi function is a, a valid submodel score is to say that it's in the tangent space. The tangent space is the space of submodel scores. Um, but now we have now we have a lower bound. We found the best possible submodel to use to give us the greatest lower bound, and it's the submodel with p as the score. Uh, right, and we use that differentiability to show that uh, to figure out what this was. And so now we have a we actually have a non-parametric analog of this Kramer Rao lower bound. Right? By maximizing this lower bound across all possible submodels. And so the, this one specific phi that's in the tangent space that actually is a valid submodel score is called the efficient influence function. Um, so in some, in some examples, that Taylor expansion can hold for multiple functions phi, but there's only going to be one that can be a valid score, it turns out. Um, right, but the big picture uh, result here is that now we have a lower bound. We know that in this local asymptotic sense, no estimator in the non-parametric model uh, can be an estimator that's rooted consistent and asymptotically normal with this particular variance, the variance of this feed function. Because this is a lower bound in the parametric submodels, and it's the best, it's the lower bound in the sort of best submodel uh, that gives us the biggest lower bound. Uh, right, so now we know that no, no estimator in a non-parametric model can beat this kind of result. So if we find an estimator that attains this, then we can stop and rest easy knowing that we have hit the lower bound. But we still don't know if we can actually attain it. Right? This might be a useless lower bound. We don't know that for sure. Uh, and so the next part is all about trying to figure out whether we can actually construct estimators that attain this. And it turns out you can do it in this very general way using the influence function. 
this make sense? So now we found, like we could pick any H and we would get a lower bound. If we can find, uh, if, if we use this H that uh, appeared in that distributional Taylor expansion, then we get uh, the best lower bound based on our logic here. Um, but we still don't know if it can be attained. Okay. So now we have, to, we have to check that we can actually construct an estimator that, uh, that hits this lower bound. So we have a lower bound, it looks like this, where B is the efficient influence function. It's the, the, uh, that function appearing in the distributional Taylor expansion, and it's the unique one that can act as a valid submodel score. So maybe we'll take a, although actually this is like an important side step, but we'll, no, I think this is just, uh, Saying what I said. This is a natural stopping point. So oh, yeah. if we found a lower bound, now we want to figure out if we can attain it. We'll do that in a second. We know is at least a valid lower bound in a non parametric model, but we still don't know if it's a useful lower bound and that it can be attained. And to construct this lower bound, we use this clever device of a parametric submodel, and we exploited the smoothness of the functional to, um, uh, to figure out what the best choice of submodel is to maximize that lower bound. Okay, so uh, before we actually go to see whether we can attain this bound, let's just look at some examples of these influence functions B of parameters. Okay, so the derivative term in that um, distributional Taylor expansion. And then as I hinted at, uh, if we know that function, then we basically know uh, an exact expression for the bias of a plugin, and we can estimate that bias and subtract it out. And so that's a huge part of how, that's basically the main story of how you construct doubly robust estimators, influence function based estimators in general. Um, so yeah, I think deriving these influence functions is a little bit of an art. Um, I know a, a few tricks uh, that I've found to be really useful, I don't know, Maybe they're obvious. I don't know why they haven't appeared in the, in the literature. But um, so the, the most direct way is just to actually uh, just derive exactly this quantity. So you can just ana analytically do this. Uh, right? You have some particular submodel. You evaluate your functional at that submodel, and you just take a usual derivative, and then you check. You try and rearrange so that you can make this equal the something that looks like a covariance of some mean zero function with the score from this submodel. So that's sort of the most direct way to do it, but it's not always the easiest. Um, so I found that uh, it can be a lot easier sometimes to just pretend like the data are discrete, uh, and then compute some, something like a Gatto derivative, for example, um, in the discrete case, and then you can almost immediately see what will happen in the general case uh, where you might have some things floating around. Um, I actually, when I compute influence functions, I actually don't do that. I, uh, I use some basic building blocks of uh, so knowing what influence functions are for certain kinds of quantities. And then uh, functionals are typically some, so for example, for like regression functions, in the discrete case, you could figure out what the influence function is. And then a lot of the functionals that appear in causal inference look like uh, combinations of regression functions and densities, um, and then you can use uh, derivative, kind of elementary uh, derivative rules because the influence function actually acts as a derivative in this distributional Taylor expansion. Um, and so this actually makes some of the, the driving influence functions very simple and, and fast. Uh, and then you can always go back and check just to make sure you haven't made a mistake uh, doing this, and then you actually know what the you have a sort of candidate influence function, and you can you don't have to just rearrange and play around. You can actually just check that it, uh, it works out. Um, so let's just look at some simple examples. So the simplest example by far is just for the mean of some uh, some random variable. So that's our functional, just the expected value of, of some random variable z with that speed p, say. Um, so we can in this case we can actually just do the direct way. And it's, it's so simple that it works out in a couple lines. So right, we want to show, again, to show that this is an influence 
uh, or to find an influence function, we want to uh, show that this derivative can be expressed as the covariance with this influence function with the score. Right? And that came from the pathwise differentiability condition or the smoothness, the, the distributional Taylor expansion. Uh, so here we can just analytically work through this. So right, we know what our functional is. We can evaluate it at a submodel here and just take a derivative. Right, so here all I did was plug in the definition of the, uh, the parameter, the functional. Right, so now I'll move the, this derivative inside the integral. And then here I'll use the fact that the derivative of the log is the derivative Derivative of the log density is the derivative of the density over the density. Right? So it's just the usual derivative of the log rule. And so now we have something that looks like, uh, like we're, we're getting close, right? We have something that looks like a mean of something like the score times, times something. Um, right? When we evaluate at epsilon equals zero, by construction of our submodel, we get back the true p. Um, so that piece turns into that true p. And then um, right, we want, so it looks like the influence function is something like just z itself. Um, uh, but we want the influence function to have mean zero. So we just need to center it. And these things are equal just because scores have mean zero. So we didn't do anything here. All we did was subtract zero by centering. Uh, and now we're done. Now we have, right, this is exactly what we wanted. It's the uh, Expected value of the product of the score and some mean zero function, which is the same as the covariance in this case. All right, so now we're, we're done. We have the influence function um, or an influence function here. It turns out in a non parametric model, there's always going to be one influence function and it's the efficient one. Um, I think I have a proof for that somewhere uh, here in the slides. Um, but yeah, so uh, it's pretty simple. In this case, we have we have the influence function. Uh, in this case, that von Mises expansion holds exactly without any second order remainder at all. Um, and you can also see immediately that the bound is attained here, right? So the the bound is the variance of of z, and the simplest estimator, which is just the sample average, right? We know just by the central limit theorem this. Uh, variance of this thing is exactly the variance of, uh, of z itself, which is the lower bound. Right? So it's uh, sort of trivial in this case to find the lower bound um, by finding that influence function. We know that the variance of that efficient influence function is a lower bound. And then here, just the simplest estimator, the most natural estimator, which is just a sample average, like a plug-in type estimator, actually attains that lower bound. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so let's think about a uh, slightly more interesting example. So uh, we could think about our parameter of interest being a conditional mean. So in general, this will not have an influence function if x is continuous. But in the discrete case, it, it will. Um, you can sort of see why it wouldn't have an influence function in the continuous case, because we had that minimax result from before that said, uh, right, you can never construct an estimator that has a uh, faster rate of convergence than n to the minus beta over 2 beta plus d. Uh, and if there was an influence function here, we can construct an estimator that would be root inconsistent. Uh, so that can't be the case. Uh, but in the discrete case, that everything works fine. There is an influence function. Uh, and you can show that it looks like this. It looks like something like a residual uh, with some indicator and, and weighting. Uh, and there are a couple ways you can check this. So one, one sort of simple way would be to write this uh, conditional expectation as a ratio uh, of expectations, and then use that trick that I mentioned earlier, where you use the fact that influence functions are derivatives. So uh, the influence function of some combination of some function of parameters, uh, you can use uh, chain rules and things, so, uh, quotient rule in this case. Um, and then you, you can get back this, this quantity. You could also uh, just do the same analytical thing uh, from the previous example. Uh, but this, yeah, this trick of using just standard simple derivative rules is really useful 
I feel like I learned it too late and I saved a bunch of hours afterwards. So hopefully you guys make use of it if you, if you ever derive these things. Um, yeah, it's, it's really useful. For example, if you think about the, that longitudinal causal effect parameter, right? this is a mess of uh, conditional densities and regression function. Uh, so it's just a lot easier to, to use these, these tricks to compute influence functions in these, in these cases. Uh, so let's check the integrated square density. Right, so here, our functional is integral of density squared. Here, again, we're just plugging in some submodel, um, kind of taking a derivative, moving the derivative inside the integral. Uh, now we use uh, just the chain rule or whatever. Um, and again, the, that property that the derivative of the log is the derivative over the density. Um, and so now, again, we have something that looks like we have a score inside, and we have uh, an expected value, and then we have something uh, out front that looks like it should be an influence function, and, and we have to center it now so it doesn't mean zero, just like we did before. Um, so now we've figured out the influence function for the integrated square density. It's basically two times the density. And here, the, that remainder term in the von Mises expansion in the distributional Taylor expansion is non-trivial. Um, it's not just zero. It, it looks like the uh, L2 norm uh, difference between P and Q squared. So this is a typical kind of remainder that you'll see. Right? It involves some difference between P and Q uh, squared. And this is really the uh, yeah, sort of the magical part um, this is why you can construct estimators using influence functions that can be rooted, consistent, in non-parametric models. Because if you imagine evaluating this remainder term at, say, some estimator p hat and p, this will be negligible um, if you have, say, into the quarter type rates for the estimator uh, p hat. We'll talk about uh, this in, in examples shortly, but just to give you some idea of where we're going. Um, because of the squaring, right? So you don't actually, you can kill the estimation error in this remainder term uh, with slower than root end rates, which means you can use non-parametric estimators, flexible estimators, and still look at a, a nice estimator for the quantity of interest that's root and consistent, asymptotically normal. So this, yeah, the remainder term, I think it's uh, the most fun part maybe of finding uh, this expansion. It's always sort of exciting for me to figure out what the remainder term is gonna look like. It tells you uh, what kind of regularity conditions you'll need um, to construct nice estimators and things. Uh, yeah, we'll see some examples of that. Um, so here's the Gatto derivative approach. Um, so this is, this is pretty old, but it's, it can be useful in, in these problems. So uh, right, all this is doing is evaluating that same derivative of the functional um, at a submodel. But it's doing it for a particular submodel. And it's a submodel that uh, sort of fluctuates uh, the, the distribution away uh, in, uh, in the direction of a point mass. And um, the reason why this, so technically this only works in the discrete case, which is why, why I said uh, we can just assume everything's discrete, roll through this machinery, and then just uh, usually in every problem I've ever worked on, you can immediately see what it would be in the. Um, what the influence function would be in the general case. Uh, uh, and at worst, you could always just check this pathwise differentiality result. Um, yeah, but technically, this only works in the discrete case because this submodel might not be a valid, uh, <coughs> a valid submodel if you're if you have continuous things or some mixtures. <clears throat> and the reason why this works is because. For this particular submodel, we basically picked an H so that uh, the score is a point mass. And so when you take right, the pathwise differentiability result says that the that derivative of the functional at the submodel equals the covariance between the influence function and the score. And so if you pick this particular submodel for the this Gatto type submodel, the score itself is a point mass. So when you integrate, right, you just get out the influence function itself at a particular point. 
And so this is like a trick for just picking a submodel, an easy submodel that makes it so that when you compute this analytic derivative, it immediately spits out the influence function at a point, and you don't have to worry about this rearranging. Um, so the influence function for the average treatment effect under a non-parametric model looks like this. Uh, you might have seen this before if you've seen double robust estimator. So right, it looks like some inverse probability weighted residual term uh, plus the regression function, and then we need to center it so we subtract off the parameter. Um, you can derive this using all the same tools I did before. It takes a few a few lines. It's pretty straightforward. Um, And here the second order remainder is, is maybe even more interesting. So it involves some squared uh, errors or squared differences. But here it involves a product of a difference between propensity scores at P and at P bar, which is just some other distribution. This is like the Q I was using earlier. And the regression function at P and P bar. Right? And they're multiplying. And so this is exactly where double robustness comes from. This, the error here uh, is a product of errors in two different nuisance functions. And so this could be going to zero as long as one of those two is going to zero. So we'll talk about this more too later. This is just sort of hinting at double robustness. This all comes from the, this Taylor expansion. Um, right, so yeah, so far we've mostly just focused on the non parametric model case. Um, here, there's only one influence function, and it's the efficient one. Uh, this is a property of, of non-parametric models. If you put some restriction on uh, on the model, so for example, if you're in an experiment, you know the propensity score, or you're putting some parametric assumption somewhere but leaving everything else unspecified, then you get uh, you get more influence functions, more than one. So with semi-parametric, proper semi-parametric models, you get uh, multiple influence functions, possibly very many. Um, and the reason why that is is because you're you're putting some restrictions on the scores, the submodel scores. And so then that uh, pathwise differentiability condition that the derivative equals the uh, covariance between some function and the scores is less restricted because you only need this to hold for, for fewer scores. Uh, there's still only one efficient influence function in, in semi-parametric models, even though there are many possibly influence functions. And it's that one influence function that is, is also a valid submodel score. So in proper semi-parametric models, you have to find not only influence functions, but you also have to find the one that's in that is a valid score for a submodel. So here's just a, a result I mentioned earlier. So here's how we show that the efficient influence function is unique. I think I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, but you can look at it um, on your own if you're interested. Uh, and let's look at what happens here in the semi-parametric model, say in an experiment where we know the propensity score. So now you can, you can show that uh, for any function that looks like this, <clears throat> so it looks very similar to, to what we had before, except we don't have to use uh, the regression function for this g. We could imagine any function of x. And this will always be a valid influence function in this semi-parametric model. So now we have a bunch of influence functions. We can stick in any g here. Whereas before, in the non-parametric model for the average treatment effect, uh, only one function of this form worked. And it was the one where g equals the true regression function. Um, but the efficient influence function is the same here as it is in the non parametric case. Um, and so maybe just uh, we can think about for a second why these influence functions in the semi-parametric model are not influence functions in the non-parametric model. Um, and so the reason is that the scores differ. So in the, uh, the semi-parametric model where you know the propensity score, you're putting some restriction on the scores. You're saying that the you actually know the propensity score. So when you construct a submodel, right, in the semi-parametric model, there's you, you don't have any sort of epsilon floating around for the propensity score because it's just some number that you know. 
right? So when you construct the submodel, it has fewer components than it does in the non-parametric model, where you don't know anything about the probability of distribution. Uh, distribution. <clears throat> right, so the scores are different here. And so that means, uh, so for example, you can check that uh, when you take these influence functions of this form for some generic G and look at their covariance with the scores from the non-parametric model, they don't equal the, the derivative that we want. Uh, so, and that's because we do equal that here because that zero cancels out uh, some extra pieces that are floating around here that aren't canceled if we actually have some contribution to the score from the fact that we don't know the propensity score. So, yeah, when, when the propensity score is unknown, uh, all of those things are actually valid submodel scores. So they're valid choices of, of H, but they're not valid influence functions. And the reverse is true when the propensity score is known. There, those functions are valid influence functions, but they're not valid submodel scores. And this is all because the submodel scores differ from the fact that we know the propensity score on one case and not on the other. And so this uh, really fancy graphic says, uh, kind of displays what's going on. So in the non-parametric case, we've got some big space of possible scores for submodels. And there's only one uh, that's an influence function, and it's the efficient influence function. Uh, in the semi-parametric model, some of those submodel scores turn into influence functions by virtue of the fact that we know the propensity score. Um, and the efficient influence function stays the, the same. This is mainly just to give you a taste of what happens in the semi-parametric model. I, I typically work in, in fully non-parametric models, but obviously semi-parametric models are, are important. They come up um, pretty frequently, especially in these experimental cases. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I think there's some difference between a semi-parametric model that you see in an experiment where you actually know the propensity score versus a semi-parametric model where you make some parametric assumption, some restriction. Um, so, for example, one kind of uh, interesting kind of classical semi-parametric model, causal inference, would be one where you assume the conditional treatment effect follows some some known parametric form, but then you don't assume anything else. Uh, so, for example, maybe so this is kind of like the Cox model, right? So we specify some parametric form for the difference, but we leave say the regression function under control, completely unspecified. Right? So either one of these two functions could be very complex, but the difference we're saying we know is some simple function. So maybe it's linear in the axis or something. And so this is a, a parametric model, or a semi-parametric model. Um, so I, I typically, in this case, I don't know if it's because I'm lazy or because I don't like the assumptions or what, but in this case, I wouldn't actually assume that that conditional effect follows a parametric model, I would just say I'm going to try and go after the best fitting, uh, possibly wrong parametric form for that conditional uh, effect. And, and then you translate this problem into a non-parametric model. You just say my parameters are defined as, say, the um, those parameters have minimized, say, the, maybe the mean squared error between. Uh, so we've got some conditional effect. And we uh, can think about how far away that conditional effect is from some some model for it, maybe just a you know linear model or something. Uh, <clears throat> we can think about say a mean squared error, and then we define our parameters as say the parameters that minimize this. Uh, and here we're not assuming that conditional effect uh, is actually linear. We're just saying we're finding the best fitting linear approximation. And, and then you can work on a non-parametric model, and you don't have to worry about finding all the influence functions. So I like that approach in general. Um, okay. Right. So we have uh, we have lower bounds. We know how to construct them. We can find these von Mises type expansions. Um, but we still don't know if they're any use to us, because it could be that they're too uh, too small, 
and there may not be any estimator that attains the lower bounds. So now let's go to, the, to actually working with some data and see how we can actually construct estimators that attain these lower bounds. Um, and ideally, we, we want to do this in a way that's uh, not very restrictive, like the sort of non-parametric plugin approach that we talked about, where we can use sort of arbitrarily flexible estimators if we like, and not have to worry too much about uh, complexity conditions or um, you know, tuning up specific parameters in very specific ways. Hopefully we can just use cross-validation and, and let the data tell us everything. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I already mentioned this notation earlier, so I'm gonna use this even more here once we start working with estimators. Um, right, so this P of F, again, it's, it's an expected value. You can think about it as an expected value of a function over its arguments conditional on any data that was used to construct that function. So if f is just some fixed function, this is just the usual expectation that you've seen before. If f is some f hat that you've actually estimated from data, then this is not going to be an expected value. Uh, it's an expected value conditional on the sample that was used to construct that, that estimator. So it's just an expectation over the arguments. So for example, this quantity, the expected value of that hat is not the same as P of that hat. Because P of that hat still has some randomness that comes from the sample that was used to construct that hat. It's just an expectation over its arguments. Um, but when F is fixed, then expected value of that does equal P of that. Are there any questions about that? Does that make sense? It sort of plays an important role in the next parts. We have this really nice distributional Taylor expansion as long as our parameter of interest is smooth enough. Um, and by smooth enough, I just mean it, it has this, we can find some version of this expansion. Um, right? And we know that this P, this magical P function is, is called the influence function for the parameter. Uh, we saw how that gives us a, a lower bound in a non-parametric model. Um, in this R2, we saw some examples of that second order remainder. Uh, they involve squared differences of differences between Q and P. And now once we have this expansion, yeah, I think this is really crucial, but uh, this tells us immediately what, what happens with the plug-in estimator. So we can use this expansion to analyze a plug-in estimator. The plug-in estimator just takes the definition of the functional and plugs in P hat for um, and so this is telling us something about the bias of the uh, plug-in estimator, and we see that it has some first-order bias <coughs> that looks like the mean of the influence function at p hat plus some second-order remainder term. In uh, this first-order bias, we analyzed this actually when we looked at the integrated square density, and this is the one that we said uh, in non-parametric cases would dominate, could, could be large, and would ruin our chances at getting a, a rooting consistent estimator. So this is that problematic piece that, that killed us in the integrated square density case. Um, but we can see if, if we have this expansion, uh, right, it's actually a very simple expression for bias. It's just an expected value of some known thing. Right? We know phi, we derived it in this expansion, and evaluating it at p hat, p hat is some initial estimator we have, and we know what this is. Um, so this is just like an expected value of a fixed function that we know. And we know how to estimate expected values really well, we're just estimating the sample averages. Um, right, so we can very easily estimate this bias and just subtract it off and construct a new estimator, which looks like the plugin with this bias part subtracted. It constructs some estimators and see if these the last hour or two is, is any, any use to us. Uh, right, so we have this nice expansion. This tells us something about the bias of the plugin, and it sort of immediately suggests how we could correct it. Um, right, so all we do is estimate this bias term with a sample average instead of this expected value. So we replace that unknown p with a pn, say. Um, and that's our new estimator. So we just take the plugin and subtract off the bias 
the bias with minus the expected value of p at p hat. So we just add this term, uh, and that's our estimator. Does everybody see where that came from? It's pretty simple. It just comes straight from that distributional Taylor expansion. <clears throat> and now we're going to try and analyze this thing in some generality without worrying about specific functionals uh, and give some general results that will let us, uh, for example, estimate p, construct this p hat in a flexible way, uh, you know, where we can use random forest or deep learning or boosting or whatever we like. Um, okay, so here, <clears throat> all I did was, right, the left-hand side of that earlier expansion, here, I'm adding an estimate of this term. And I need to add that to the right-hand side as well. So that's where this p in of p, p hat comes from. And then everything else was just from that original expansion. So this is just adding the sample average of the, that phi hat uh, to both sides. Right? So nothing, nothing interesting here. All I did was add an estimate of the bias. And now I'm just going to add and subtract again. So right, this looks like this term. What we want is something like a centered sample average plus some remainder term that we hope we can kill in a non-parametric model so that we have a nice asymptotically efficient estimator that looks rude and consistent and asymptotically uh, normal. Uh, so we're almost there. Right? We have something like a centered sample average, but the issue is that the, it's a centered sample average of a not a fixed function. It's a function that we depends on some estimated stuff that might be very complex, right? It's because it depends on p hat. So this could so for example in the average treatment effect case, right? The, that phi looked like inverse probability weighted residual plus regression function. So our estimate of that would be you know we estimate the propensity score using whatever methods we like, we estimate the regression function using random forest or whatever, and we estimate that influence function. And then we add it back to the plugin. Right? So this will depend on, in the treatment effect case, some complicated estimates of uh, propensity score and the regression function. So we can't just apply a central limit theorem to analyze this term, because it has some data-dependent pieces. Right? So now we're just going to add and subtract to try and uh, separate the relevant parts. So we, all we're doing is adding and subtracting a centered sample average of, of the true influence function instead of the estimated one. Right, so I added it here, and then I just need to subtract it here. So that's what this is. And now, uh, yeah, I'm sort of in love with this decomposition. I think it clarifies a lot of things. So uh, now we have three terms. Uh, right, the first term is a centered sample average of something that is hopefully going to zero, right? If p hat is zero is consistent, this should be something that's whose variance is shrinking. Uh, the second term is a centered sample average of just a fixed function. We immediately know the central limit theorem tells us exactly how this behaves. Uh, and then we have a third term, which is the second order remainder piece, which comes from that smoothness of the functional, which we hope just involves squared differences between p hat and p. And so that means we'll see exactly how this works, but that means we can actually kill this term. This could be negligible after multiplying by root n, even in a non-parametric model, because we won't need root n rates for p hat to make this term very small. Um, and so the end, end result is if we can kill the first term and the third term, then we have an efficient estimator its asymptotic variance is the variance of the influence function, which we know is a lower bound if it's the efficient influence function. And so we're done. We have an asymptotically efficient estimator that's locally asymptotically many max. And so now the whole task is just to kill the first and third terms and try to figure out how and if we can do that. Does that make sense? <coughs> Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll just mention how this relates to some things maybe you've heard about, like uh, targeted maximum likelihood or targeted learning. Uh, so this, the bias correction that I described is sometimes called a one-step correction. Uh, uh, sometimes people call it like an estimating equation approach to constructing an estimator. Uh, 
There's an alternative approach uh, called TMLE, uh, which does uh, exactly the same thing asymptotically. It just does the bias correction in a slightly different way. Um, so instead of estimating the bias directly and adding it to the plugin, it instead constructs some p hat star so that that uh, so that the plugin evaluated at that p hat star looks up to some small negligible error exactly like our bias corrected estimator. And so the trick is just to find some uh, special p hat star so that this is so that this holds. And so here you can think about this as doing bias correction not on the sort of functional scale but on the p scale and evaluating the functional at the bias corrected p. Um, and so this is going to be asymptotically equivalent because by definition this is constructed so that it equals that bias corrected term that we, that we expressed earlier. Um, uh, but this, the TMLE type approach can give better finite sample properties. For example, if your functional is bounded between zero and one, if you correct on the p scale, at least if you do it appropriately, then your resulting estimator has to be between zero and one. Whereas our bias correction, where we just added an estimate of the bias, it could go outside of zero and one. For example, in the treatment effect case, that correction term that we add is the inverse probability rate weighted residual. And so if you have extreme propensity scores, that thing could possibly push you outside the bounds of the parameter space. Um, so to me, that's the, that's the only benefit of TMLE. It's doing bias correction. It's doing it on the P scale instead of the parameter scale, which ensures that it respects natural bounds of the parameter space. Uh, but the goal is exactly the same, and it constructs estimators that are asymptotically equal. All right, so our, uh, our whole thing now is just trying to kill that first and third term. Um, so the first term looks like, so this GN notation means PN minus P. This is just another shorthand. Uh, actually, it means root N times PN minus P. So this is exactly that first term that we wrote earlier. And the second term, we want these to be negligible after scaling by root N, right? Uh, because we know that second term, if you scale by root n, converges to a normal. So we want to show that these two uh, terms are, are going to zero, are a little over p of one. And then we have, by the central limit theorem, that our, uh, our estimator is asymptotically normal with asymptotic variance equal to that efficiency bound that we derived. <clears throat> Um, all right, so those are our two goals, and we just want to show that you can do this in, in sort of flexible non-parametric models and, and show how to do it. Um, so for the first term, uh, this is easier to, to kill. Uh, this, is, this is this empirical process term. Uh, it's the centered sample average of something that's shrinking as long as p hat is consistent. Um, and because it's centered, uh, that's, that's what helps us a lot. So there are, in general, two ways to kill that first term, that empirical process term. Uh, the first one is by putting some restrictions on the function class that P lies in. So for example, in the average treatment effect case, you would put some complexity restrictions on the propensity score and the regression function. So you might assume that they're, they have beta derivatives or something. Um, An alternative approach to killing that first term is, uh, is a really nice simple one where you actually don't have to put any complexity restrictions on that class. You just use sample splitting to prevent overfitting. So the reason you use these complexity restrictions is to, so that overfitting isn't possible. But another way to avoid that is just to sample split. So you take half the sample and you estimate the components of P, so like in the treatment effect case, the propensity score and the regression function, and then you take the other sample, which you haven't touched yet, and estimate the influence function on that part of the sample. So you plug in your p hat from the first part of the sample to the influence function on the second part, and then you average it there. And this, this is sort of a magically simple result, uh, a very old result, uh, that lets you avoid these sort of messy empirical process uh, complexity restrictions. Um, so I'm going to talk about this first. And I'm going to skip 
the empirical processes part. Um, yeah, you can maybe spend some time in the notes, or I'd be happy to chat afterwards. Uh, but I want to make sure we get to the second order of the interterms. Um, and the sample splitting piece is really nice. It's extremely easy to implement. The proof uh, of why it works is way simpler than any of the empirical process stuff. And it works under exactly the same conditions uh, without as many assumptions. You just don't need any of the empirical process conditions. Um, so, but big picture, the sort of classical way to kill the first term is to assume non-parametric but some complexity restrictions on the on p. So, for example, on the propensity score and regression function. Um, and the conditions are pretty pretty weak, so uh, they're non-parametric. You don't have to assume that you have a parametric um, correctly specified parametric model. So, here's a list of some function classes that are appropriately um, simple so that that first term is sort of automatically killed. Um, so smooth functions, for example, um, functions that have some, that don't vary too much. Um, these are all things that uh, allow you to kill that first term without using sample splitting. Just because this restricts the function class enough, you can't overfit. Um, but we don't know that uh, right? We don't really know what the structure is um, of the underlying parts of P, the regression function of the propensity score. And for a lot of estimators, we don't know. They may be able to do well even when uh, there's some, uh, some messy structure that we don't understand. Um, for example, in high dimensional cases, these, the, the classical Dotsker type assumptions, which are the complexity restrictions you need, uh, don't hold. And so, uh, yeah, it's unclear if this. Uh, all the, the classical empirical process stuff will work with sort of modern adaptive methods. Um, but this, yeah, the sample splitting thing allows us to not worry about this. Um, and yeah, this is, this is an old idea. It's become sort of popular recently again, but it's, it was used for exactly the same purposes in the, in the 80s. Um, and the idea is very simple. So we just we split our data. Uh, you can imagine splitting it just into two parts, but you can split it in more complicated ways. Um, and then you fit, uh, you estimate P, you construct P hat on one part, and then you evaluate the influence function on the other part. And you don't let those two parts touch. Uh, and then you, uh, got a picture here. Right, so let's, we split our data into folds. For some of the folds, we can we estimate these nuisance functions, the things like propensity scores and regression functions. This is constructing p hat that we're going to use when we construct the uh, plug-in estimator and the bias corrected version. And then we we use another fold which we haven't touched to actually construct that bias correction. Okay. Uh, and we could stop there actually, uh, but if we want to retain full uh, efficiency instead of say n over two efficiency. Then we can just swap. So we can then use the the other folds for. Uh, so let's think about the two-fold case just for simplicity. Then we can use the first half. Uh, right, first, we use the first half to construct p hat. Second half to to evaluate the influence function. We can construct the estimator on the second half. Then we just swap. We construct the p hat on the second half and use the first half for constructing the estimator, and we average the two. And then we retain full efficiency if we know. We lose some constants, but no, no uh, nothing in terms of sample size. Um, there's a really uh, simple way to show that this works. Um, there's, I'm sure people have proved this lots of times. Uh, I have a short proof in, in one of my papers. Um, it's, it's so simple. It's much more simple, I think, than the empirical process stuff. So if we, this is just sort of a general result, if we imagine some function uh, f hat that we've constructed by estimating some f from one sample, and then we think about averaging that f hat on another sample. This is exactly what we're doing when we do this sample splitting. Right? We have, you think about f hat as being um, uh, the, the pieces of, of p hat that we use, and then we average it over a new, a new sample um, when we evaluate the influence function uh, at that p hat and, and average it. Um, so yeah, the proof is like three lines. You just you literally just analyze the, the mean and variance of this thing, um, 
and show that it's going to zero after you multiply by, by root n. Um, you don't need any, you don't have to think about function classes of, for f, uh, you just literally compute the mean invariance um, uh, and, and you're done. Uh, so it's very simple. The sample splitting makes things very easy. I think maybe originally it was used as sort of a, just a technical device to simplify proofs, but now it's actually useful because we have these very complex adaptive methods that uh, if we don't do sample splitting, we'll, we'll overfit. Um, so it's actually practically necessary. Um, I know that was a bit a bit fast. Um, I just want to get to the, the last part. Um, all right. Uh, so just to recap, there are these two ways to kill that that empirical process term, either with complexity restrictions or with sample splitting. And uh, yeah, I'd be more than happy to talk afterwards, or if you want to email me later, if you're interested in the details of sample splitting, um, definitely feel free. Did you include those in your reference list? Uh, I think so. I think so. Um, okay. So now uh, we can kill that first term, that empirical process term. The second term is the central limit theorem term. And now we have that third second order remainder term. And this to me is like the most interesting term probably. Um, it's, it, it depends heavily on the functional that you're considering and it looks different for everyone. So this is always like the most fun part when you come up with some new functional or you, uh, your investigator or the person you're working with tells you what they want and you haven't seen this functional before and then you drive this expansion and you get the, the second order remainder. It's always uh, exciting to see, see what it looks like. Um, and this is what I think yeah, makes this whole bias correction procedure work uh, because we can kill this term under non-parametric conditions. And by kill, I mean we want it to look like little op one over root n. We want it to be going to zero after we multiply by a root n. Um, and this is what distinguishes this approach from a, a simple plug-in estimator. So for a simple plug-in estimator, we also get that central limit term, and we also get that empirical process term. And so everything we've done with those two terms also applies there. But then we have a third term, which is not second order. It's some bigger bias term, just like we saw in the integrated square density example. Um, so right, we saw it, that, that remainder term is exactly zero in the mean case. That's sort of obvious just because we don't have to estimate any nuisance functions to estimate a, a mean. Um, so it's sort of boring. In the integrated density squared case, it's a little more interesting. Remember, we saw the influence function looks like two times the density. And we saw that. We have that simple analysis where we looked at the uh, a naive plugin and saw why you'd have this big bias term that could dominate that whole expression, and so it wouldn't in general be rude and consistent. Um, and so it turns out if you go through this bias correction process for the integrated density squared, you get something that looks like this. So it looks like two times the original plugin uh, minus another plugin, basically. A different plugin. Um, so this is the bias corrected estimator based on finding that influence function. So all we do here is we take the plugin estimator that we had before and we add to it an estimate of this, uh, uh, an estimate of the average of the estimate of the mean of the influence function. So we take a sample average of two times p hat. Right, and now we have this uh, three-term expansion. The first term is the empirical process term. We can kill that with either complexity restrictions or sample splitting. Second term is a nice central limit theorem term. It's asymptotically normal with uh, variance equaling variance of 2p. And then we have the second order remainder. And uh, in an earlier slide, we, we saw that this looks like the integrated uh, squared difference of the uh, p hat and p. <coughs> And so this is exactly the, L, the squared L2 norm of uh, L2 error P hat. And so the, the optimal, uh, right, this is just like an error measure of P hat as an estimator in estimating the dense CP. Uh, and we know that the best possible uh, rate for the root of that error is this n to the minus two beta, or n to the minus beta over two beta plus D. 
Um, so we need the square of this to be greater than one half in order for this term to be negligible uh, and to not, uh, right, for us to kill this in this, in this whole expansion. Um, and so if we're thinking about our density being beta smooth, here we need beta over uh, being greater than d over 2. So we need uh, to have uh, right, the number of derivatives being at least half the dimension. If you remember, for the plug-in estimator, we needed the number of derivatives to be greater than the dimension. So we're having right, uh, uh, as much smoothness as we needed for the plug-in. Okay, so that's nice. We need half as weak smoothness assumptions when we do this. Uh, but probably more importantly is uh, we don't have to do any under smoothing. So you can show that, for example, if you tune this p hat with cross validation, uh, right, you would get this rate if you're using an optimal estimator of p hat. Um, and you don't have to pick the bandwidth in this special way to, to under smooth. Right? So you can, you can kill this term even by uh, uh, estimating p hat in the optimal way that minimizes, say, mean squared error just for, or the L2 error just for estimating p. So we don't have to do any under smoothing here. The rate that you get from cross validation is enough to kill this if you're using a, an optimal estimator. Um, and this is just in the smoothness case. We actually don't even have to posit that our function is smooth. We, all we need is that the, uh, um, the rate of convergence for p hat is into the quarter. So it's squared, and so that means this, this squared R2 term will be 1 over root n if the rate for p hat is into the quarter. And so it'll be negligible after we multiply by root n. <clears throat> so it, it may not seem like a big uh, jump going from, say, root n to into the quarter, but it, it is. It opens up a whole uh, array of different kinds of estimators that we can use far weaker assumptions uh, than we would need to achieve root n rates just by lowering the bar to into a quarter rate. Let's look at the average treatment effect example. Again, we have this three term decomposition. Uh, this is for the plug in. Right? So we have the first empirical process term, we have a central limit term. And then we have a bias term, which is big. This is a plug-in estimator, so we have no hope that in general this would be small. Okay. But for the influence function-based uh, bias-corrected estimator, we have the same sort of expansion, but then the bias term is going to be small. Uh, it's going to be a thing I wrote earlier, so involving the product of errors in the propensity score and the regression function. By Cauchy Schwartz, this is less than the product of the L2 errors for pi hat and mu hat. And so again, you can see as long as each of these is, say, converging at an into the quarter rate, which we can make happen under pretty weak non parametric conditions, right? sparsity conditions or smoothness conditions that uh, can hold in, in a wide variety of non parametric models, then we can kill this error term because it involves the product of these things, not just one of them. Um, right, so there are some other examples here that you can look through um, if you're interested. Uh, right, so I, I have a, are there any questions about, about this? We have until two, is that right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, have you found that in finite samples, like in practice, does the sample splitting not hurt you much on variance? Yeah, that's a good question. I uh, I found that it, it hasn't, um, but I haven't done really extensive simulation studies of this, so that would be interesting to to play around. But um, I have seen uh, in some examples some pretty strong evidence of overfitting if I don't use sample splitting. Um, but that's probably worth studying. That's a good question. So you shouldn't lose anything in terms of rates, but in a finite sample, you lose something in terms of constants. And so you can imagine for small samples, it could potentially hurt you, especially if you um, if the complexity conditions, the non-square type assumptions are reasonable, then you wouldn't have needed to do sample splitting. 
like I sped through this part, but the, the second order remainder I think is the really cool thing. So it means you have a lower bar uh, right, that you, that you need to achieve for estimating the nuisance pieces uh, than you need for, uh, in order to get sort of faster rates for the actual thing you care about, the parameter of interest. Right? So you can withstand estimating these flexibly at slower rates, and that's fine because you have this nice product structure that allows you to um, still get a nice sort of root-in consistent estimator at the end. Um, under these sort of weak non parental conditions. Uh, yeah, the, I think the into the quarter bar uh, is, is quite a bit lower than, than root n, right? If you remember that plot at the start, into the quarter looked quite different from root n. Uh, there are lots of conditions, uh, you know, so people make a living out of studying different non parametric estimators and seeing what kind of rates of convergence they have under different kinds of conditions. And there's, uh, for almost all, non-parametric estimators, you can posit some, some non-parametric conditions under which they'll achieve into the quarter rates. So, uh, smoothness conditions are common. Um, that's probably most common, I would think, but like sparsity conditions where you imagine that, say, regression functions only depend on a subset of, of co-grades. Um, so these are non-parametric conditions where these kinds of rates are, are achievable. So, uh, yeah, maybe in the last few minutes, I'll just mention um, I, I have an R package that um, implements these things for a few specific functionals, which you guys um, are more than welcome to play around with. There's uh, some example code and stuff on my website uh, and on GitHub. Uh, and this is definitely a work in progress. I think I'll just be adding to it over time. Um, so if you see any anything interesting you want to add or if you see issues, uh, definitely let me know. Um, so yeah, here are some examples. Here's how you load the, the package, just a few lines. Um, I tried to make the code pretty easy. So for example, you can estimate average treatment effects. Um, you just throw in the outcomes, the treatment and the covariates. Um, it can be a multi value So you add another column in your data set, which is your estimated influence function. And uh, you need this anyway to construct the bias corrected estimate. And then you average that uh, to construct this estimate. And then because of that nice R2 term, um, the yeah, any extra uh, error from estimating the nuisance stuff uh, dies off. And so you can just treat this like you knew the influence function at the start, um, like that you didn't even have to estimate anything. So you just take an empirical variance of that extra column in your data set and that's your asymptotic variance, and you can compute a wall type interval in one line of code. So that's, yeah, that's really nice. You don't have to do any extensive variance calculation. And it's, it's very general, right? You don't, uh, you don't have to use a particular estimator for, for p hat um, as long as you're achieving into the quarter type conditions, then, then that holds. Uh, and you don't have to have into the quarter on both, right? You could have, uh, you know, some slow rate for one as long as the other one is faster. So they just have to both be uh, like one of the Um So yeah, in this package there are a number of different uh, causal type functionals that you can you can play around with. Um, and yeah, I'd definitely be curious if you have issues or if anything comes up. Um, and I also just wanted to say that I hope I haven't presented this like uh, everything is solved because it's definitely not not even close to being the case. So uh, even for that, the, the most basic example, the, the average treatment effect, uh, we don't know the full story. So uh, we know that under, say, into the quarter type uh, conditions, we can construct nice, optimally efficient estimators. But if those uh, conditions don't hold, so maybe the data are so high dimensional or so non-smooth that we can never even hope for into the quarter rates, uh, then we may not be able to even construct a root inconsistent estimator at all, period. Um, and uh, the theory for these cases is not, not known even for simple functionals like the average treatment effect. So Jamie Robbins has done 
uh, some really amazing work. He has a nice analyst paper in the last year, uh, which details like a decade or two of, of work, uh, where he's thinking about this case, but there are still open questions even there. Uh, and moving to other functionals, it's not clear what happens. Thinking about other kinds of, so uh, the, the minimax theory that, that is available in the case where no root in consistent estimator exists uh, is all for smooth function classes, so it's not clear what happens. For other function classes, like sparse, uh, sparse function classes, uh, so that's one, one avenue where even in this sort of simple case that I've been trying to focus on, there isn't a complete story. Um, another is just every time somebody thinks of a new functional, you have some new theory to work out. Uh, or you have to figure out what the second order remainder looks like in these things. Uh, and, and this is always interesting. I feel like people are always coming up with new, new functionals, new things to, to estimate in different kinds of problems. Um, this is what I just mentioned, that sometimes even that lower bound doesn't apply if the data are, are so high dimensional or so, uh, so not smooth. Um, there's a whole other class of problems, which I think is really interesting, where that expansion doesn't hold. Um, so you have a non-smooth type parameter. So this is the kind of stuff that Eric has worked on. Uh, uh, and I think there are, there are tons of, uh, of parameters that, that fall in this category. So, uh, and there's, there's different kinds of non-smoothness. I'd be happy to talk offline about this. Uh, but even things like conditional treatment effects, uh, if you have a continuous component, that's a non-smooth parameter where that uh, distributional Taylor expansion doesn't hold. Uh, and so all this theory doesn't work there. But it turns out there's still some nice bias correction you do. There's just no, nothing is really known about it. Uh, so that's another big important uh, open problem. So yeah, there's tons of stuff to work on in this area. Uh, so hopefully I haven't presented like everything is solved because it's, it's not even close to being the case. Uh, and then, yeah, here are some, some references that I wanted to list. So like I said, I think the literature is really hard to go through um, sort of on your own. So these are some papers that I, I've liked a lot. Um, this, I, I'm trying to write a review now, uh, but I'm being slow about, um, uh, that I think would supersede this one. So I, I would write this review paper a little differently now, but you could take a look at that if you're curious. Um, obviously, Butch's text is seminal work. Um, these first two papers, I think, are really readable and sort of nicely written and clear. Uh, there's sort of some classical textbook references, which unfortunately, I think, can also be very hard to read, um, uh, but they're nice to, nice to have. I, I think. A big way that I learned uh, a lot of this stuff is just by working through examples. Of it. Um, so going through papers for specific functionals and working out the expansion, trying to construct estimators, and figure out what the conditions are that we need to make them work. Um, so here are some nice papers with various examples that you can work through where things are clearly written and, and there's nice stuff in the appendix. Um, here's some more. Uh, I, yeah, I think overall I found that to be the most helpful, just working through, through different examples. Um, so yeah, this is just a big reference list you can, you can check out if you're interested. Here are some, some neat old papers to read. Um, now that the theory is, is more developed than it used to be, it's kind of fun to go back and read some of these uh, early uh, groundbreaking pieces of work. Um, and this is some of the stuff that I mentioned about these cases where there's no root and consistent estimator, and so uh, it's not clear what kind of estimator you should construct. It's, it's not even completely clear what the minimax lower bounds are anymore. Uh, this is that analyst paper from the last year, which is really interesting. Uh, these are hard to read, but they're fun. Uh, yeah, so thanks a lot. Uh, I'd be happy to chat with people.